Waco is wide awake. This is Baylor's day to claim another conference crown, to state its case in a world of new rules. The Bears travel uncharted waters on the Brazos, a program destined for decades to remain locked out, looking in at the elite. Baylor has spent its way, built its way, and won its way into the big time. But, and there is always a but with Baylor, but what is enough? What will it take against Kansas State? In Waco, in Atlanta, in the Charlotte and Fort Worth, the playoffs really begin today. College game day on championship Saturday in the Bears' new den on the banks of the Brazos. ESPN College Game Day. We're coming to your city. Good morning, Waco. Texas is built by the Home Depot. Proud sponsor of college football's premier pregame show. And good morning from Waco, Texas. College Game Day's first visit here. The Bears' unique, cool, intimate new home, McLean Stadium, right on the banks of the Brazos River. And a very energized Baylor fan base has arrived various methods some at a camping trip they came across the bridge across the river Brazos filed right past our set you can take mass transit the Bears are green <laughs> after all or you can come across the river in a boat tailgate <laughs> or yeah. sailgate outside of here sun come up about half hour ago but these fans have waited not just all week or all season. They've waited a long time, many decades, for Baylor to have a chance to claim a spot in a playoff. And the winner here tonight can claim at least a share of the Big 12 title. And welcome to Waco, along with Desmond Howard, Lee Corso, Kirk Hurd Street. I'm Chris Fowler. The ninth different city in the state of Texas we have brought oh, college wow. game day. that's by far the most and the 64th different campus wow. college game day mm. these folks say about time what's at stake here well there's a lot at stake both for Baylor and for Kansas State because the winner can claim a share of the Big 12 conference crown TCU about 90 miles away. <laughs> yeah. Every time I say TCU today, I promise you, they can also claim a share of the conference ground by knocking off heavy underdog Iowa State. 
Kirk, to show how interconnected all these games are in Championship Saturday, there was a tweet from an all-conference Baylor lineman who's injured, Troy Baker. And he said simply, go Tigers, go Wildcats, go Cyclones, go Yellow Jackets, <laughs> go Badgers. <laughs> the opponents of all the teams Baylor's competing against. The Wildcats. The Wildcats didn't get that tweet. <laughs> no, you can scratch off Arizona. The Ducks to Chris, yeah. I was yeah. going to say, despite the way Arizona looked last night and the way they played against Oregon, remember, on Championship Saturday, really anything is capable of happening. Here they are. Here they go. I'll just get this out of the way early. Oh, no. Any, any, no we'll do it for three hours. <laughs> Anything is capable of happening. So don't just assume that all these teams are going to win. The pressure that's on these teams. I think we even saw it as early with Oregon last night. Now, Arizona wasn't able to capitalize, right. but there's such pressure there to try to secure that last win and get into that final yep. four. And talking about last night, you're right. There was a lot of pressure. I thought that Marcus Mariota kind of responded to that pressure early. Look at the Heisman race right now. I think that Marcus Mariota at this point made a statement last night. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that he's going to win it because Mr. Melvin Gordon, what do you have for the folks tonight? The Big Ten Championship game against Ohio State, he has a chance tonight to make a statement too, Coach. Yeah, Des, let me tell you something. Baylor has been playing football for 116 years. Wow. 1,162 games. Incredible. And this is the most important game they've ever had. Why? They played number nine, Kansas State. They got a chance if they beat them to play for the national title. There's never been as much pressure on a game for, Bo for Baylor than there is tonight, boy. And I think what's cool about this system, which has not made the regular season less meaningful, is that the team is in sixth place right now in the standings, which is Baylor. On previous championship Saturdays, yeah. they're an ultra-long yeah. shot, right? Sure. You have vir yeah. virtually no chance to get in the playoff. There are two more slots available, and there are many more high-impact games, Kirk, on Championship Saturday than just one or two. Well, Championship Saturday, you think of the SEC Championship with the history and the legacy that they have there going back to 92. This is a, obviously Blake Sims has got to be able to find Amari Cooper. Remember, Missouri has the best front four in college football. They'll be able to defend him. But the big question, can Matty Mock and the Missouri offense, Des, can they find enough to be able to try to compete and win? How about the ACC championship game, Georgia Tech, Florida State. I expect Justin Thomas, the quarterback, to slice and dice and some of those defense just like every Golson did a couple of months ago. Now, I know that Jameis Winston has 99 problems, but winning the game ain't one. Hit me, Chris. <laughs> As you mentioned, the Bucks and the Badgers in Indy tonight. How well can Cardell Jones fill in for JT Barrett? 6'5", 250, gifted but very green. Wisconsin's D will make him prove his playmaking poise. Badgers stopped the run well. Joey Bosa and the Buckeyes laser focus on containing the 2K man, Melvin Gordon. Nobody better in the open field, Coach. Iowa State is beautiful. TCU. Chavon Boykin is a straw that stirs the TCU butt drink. Against Texas, he threw for over 300 yards and two touchdowns. He also ran for 50 yards in the route of Nebraska. He, he is a nightmare. He's a nightmare. Let's go yo-yo now. Now we'll go to Bryce Petty, right? Kansas State and Baylor. Petty got dinged last week. There's no way he will not play this game. He's been cleared, ready to roll. Shock Linwood, this balanced attack, 240 yards a game on the ground, gives him that great balance. And then it's up to Jake Waters and the Wildcats. His ability to throw and also at times run will be key for the Wildcats to hang in and compete today in Baylor. History says Bill Snyder seems very dangerous underdogs. Baylor just more than a touchdown favor here on the Brazos. If you look at the teams in the left-hand column, the main playoff contenders ranked one through four and then one through six with Ohio State and Baylor, the first teams out. Chances of winning. Well, Oregon took care of business. The number two team, they're a lock. Let's face it, they're a lock to get in. Either one or two seed. TCU, a five-touchdown favorite. Florida State, about a four and five point favorite there against pesky Georgia Tech. The Knowles never make it look easy. They always make their coach sweat. <laughs> Best chance of an upset most contending teams in the last I think Wisconsin. I think Wisconsin. Cardell Jones, the new quarterback from Ohio State, will have no problem playing well in this game because the game is in the dome. He doesn't have to worry about the weather conditions. Also, Ohio State has an advantage. They played in the game last year in the same place. Dez. Wisconsin better beware. No, I agree with you. Cardell's a big quarterback, 6'5", with about 250, <laughs> and he has a lot of weapons around, so that's a good one. I think that you got to look at the Florida State game, a team that's been starting off very slow. Not only do they start off slow, 
but they make a lot of mistakes early in the game. Now, playing against Georgia Tech, they love to play keep away. They're third in the nation in time of possession. They keep the ball about 34 minutes a game, and they love to just run the ball a lot. So they're averaging like 300 yards on the ground a game. I think that's a bad recipe for Florida State if they don't start off fast, Kirk. Well, and starting fast, we keep waiting for them to start fast. It's the last game of the year. I don't think they're going to start fast. We know that. <laughs> uh, and I think Georgia Tech possessing the ball, as Des says, and just trying to keep it away from Jameis Winston may be their best defense today. But I, I agree with Lee. It's weird to think about Ohio State because of what happened with JT Barrett. They come into this game as an underdog. So you're sitting here thinking about who could get upset. You're thinking of teams that would be up in the top five getting upset. But it's Ohio State sitting at five trying to upset Wisconsin with their third string quarterback. Think about how many teams could go out, lose a Heisman <laughs> Trophy candidate 10 days before the season. That backup becomes a Heisman candidate. And then he goes out in the last game of the year. You got to play a guy that's never taken a meaningful snap in a championship game. If they find a way to win, that's an impressive job by Urban Meyer and Tom Herman. Exactly. And we'll talk much more yeah. about that game. What does Ohio State have to do? What would the committee look for? Yeah. Cardo yeah. Jones, how's the offense going to yeah. perform with a new quarterback? Because that's what you got to look at going forward, right? The resume yeah. is there, but you got to judge the teams sure. how they are at the end of the season. Yeah. Right. Nobody pick Kansas State as a potential upset victim in this place. They have, by the way, won 15 in a row at home. The bear might like them. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if the bear likes them or not. Our, our Chris Felique, his nickname is the bear. You've not been the strongest bear supporter. Is, is, that, is that fair, Mr. Yeah, you're, Your little tidbit on Kansas State is an underdog to have the chance of the upset. Yeah. Last 10 regular season games, Bill Snyder's teams, touchdown underdog or more. They've won four of them outright. 9-1 against the number. Oh, they love you here, Bear. I know they do. So, so <laughs> does that trend continue? <laughs> we'll see. Well, well, the, well, line, asking, the, yeah, the line right now, is, right now is 7, so if it comes down, I'm just saying, not apply. You like we'll K-State outright today? Uh, no, I don't. I actually think Baylor win a close game. Close. Oh, I think K-State will play tough, but I think Baylor will win a close game. I'm going your okay. style there. There you go. go. Oh, oh, close, close, close <laughs> and I learned from him. <laughs> okay, keep it going. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll talk also to the selection committee chairman, Jeff Long, coming up live later in the show. Five teams going for three slots. Oh, they love everything about TCU. They love the they colors. They Damon love Carter State. They love TCU. It's 90 miles away from here, noon on ABC or ESPN3. You might have TCU fans keep the purple on. Yeah. Come on down the road here. Yeah. K okay, State tonight. <laughs> Nick Saban will visit with the Alabama coach. His team has been playing playoff light games ever since their loss to Ole Miss. This cell phone video representing an emotional scene you'll witness as UAB players and coaches react to Blazer football being dissolved. And this was the scene in Santa Clara after the slow start. Desmond talked about Ducks came on strong. We'll look back. Game day is built by the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. And in part by Dr. Pepper. Always one of a kind. And AT&T. Mobilizing your world. Brant Taft, former Baylor Bear head coach, honored in the Texas Sports Museum as is the Heisman Trophy of Davey O'Brien. They're too young to know Davey O'Brien played for two. They'd be booing him if we knew. <laughs> yeah. <Davey O'Brien. laughs> no chance there. The old ones are booing. Yeah. You just can't hear them. <laughs> She's at Real Fan Cam zooming over this unique scene. We're actually on a bridge for the Brazos. Pretty cool. Very cool. Show you the best of the signs coming up later on. Many of them mention a 61-58 for the TCU game. Many of them <laughs> That's that's good. Good. That, was that was clever. Oh, lots of love for the coach of the Horned Frogs. One true champion is what the slogan was in the Big 12, which would be ironic. That's hilarious. We're going to score 24 points. <laughs> be that much time to make this sign. I like that. that sign. They're going to like the, uh, the Baylor legend. Hall of Famer Mike Singletary will join us for Saturday selections coming up 
later on in the show. Wow. You can log on to ESPN.com, search Chevrolet to pay virtual Chevrolet Saturday selections coming up with Mr. Corso's head gear prediction. Mr. Pollock is sitting here right now. You were, I'm sure, locked in last night with the rest of us watching the Pac-12 championship game. Yep. First puzzle piece went into place. We'll ask you in a second what your takeaway is from that game. Des mentioned earlier, in rainy conditions, less than a full house in the home of the 49ers. Mariota and the Ducks offense got out to a slow start. Their defense was, was smothering Arizona. Wildcats couldn't make a first down. Mariota scampered in a couple touchdowns with his feet. Oregon had the ball in plus territory the entire first half, finally able to get a touchdown instead of settling for a field goal. It would make it 30-0 very early in the third quarter. This game was basically over at this point if it wasn't over before that. Look at this, look at this pocket presence. There, there were a couple plays. I'm going to show you one, Des, because you said that Marcus Mariota hasn't really had like the Heisman moment. Look at this. This looks like a Heisman moment. This, this, look at the, look at the clock. This third quarter, about halfway through yeah, the third quarter. No. The Wildcats defense said they were waving the white flag at this point. It's they the, were done. They did that at 13. No. I, mean, I really did. I mean, they were waving the, the white flag. They, that, group, that group in the white jerseys, they were done at that point. Right. It was really but, embarrassing to see them play that. But wait, they beat them head to head. So yeah. I thought Arizona's and better then, than Oregon. I'm going to tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> they beat them head to head. I think they were better. I thought they were better. <laughs> I, you, you're gonna say that on I think it's better. Really boo you. Marcus Mariota. It's better though. After yeah. the game, he's won his first conference title hey. as, a, as a starter. He played great. They're better. For us, we just wanted to go out there and, and play the best game that we could. Um, the last couple of years, we haven't been able to, to put that out there against them. And um, you know, tonight was just a great example of us kind of playing a complete game as a team. You know, they played well. We didn't. Our coach just outplayed us. We did a nice job. We didn't execute well. If this guy isn't what the Heisman Trophy is all about, then I'm in the wrong profession. Just on the field and off the field, our team's made up of a bunch of guys that, that, that are in his mold, and, and a lot of that is due to his leadership. Uh, obviously, on the field, I think that, that speaks for itself, but if you want your son or daughter to have a role model, pick this guy. Marcus, you want to echo that? Thanks, Coach, for all the nice <laughs> 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 Marcus never focuses on awards. What is, what is this coach going to say? He never Five focuses on himself coach, either. Yeah. Talk about the team. He's impressive, man. And talk about the defense. I mean, can you give Don Pelham a little credit? Yep. What they did to Arizona's offense, I mean, that was impressive. They Very impressive. They outgained by 400 yards. Arizona's supposed to have their number. Rich Rod's right. They didn't show up. They didn't play well for a young team in a championship game. But, but give credit to Oregon because they certainly did exactly. show what they could do. That defense owned them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You talk about running the football. They've had so much success against everybody, including Oregon, over the past couple years. They didn't do anything. And Armstead was up front. Buckner, those guys, Washington, they were winning. They were dominating. This is the kind of defense you've wanted to see from Oregon. Oregon has been dominant since they lost to, since they lost to Arizona. Since yeah. Jake Fisher got back in the lineup, I think they made a great statement last night with a non-conference win against Michigan State, which is more impressive than Alabama's against West Virginia, and the way they've dominated since Fisher came back in the lineup, that they could be the number one seed in the college football playoff. It could be. I, I'm a Pac-12 fan. I'm a Larry Scott fan, the commissioner of the Pac-12, but a Friday night game at 9 o'clock Eastern in an NFL stadium, in a half-empty stadium, probably not the best move to sell what the Pac-12 really has to offer. I, I thought last night was not a good showing as far as the conference is concerned. Oregon looks great. Mariota is great. Mark Helfrich has done an amazing job. He and his staff from the time they lost to Arizona put the pieces together and showed that, hey, life goes on without Chip Kelly. We can still win big games. And as Des, they put themselves now in a position, yeah. whether they're one or two, depends on what Bama will do, but they're still going to probably end up in the Rose Bowl. In fact, they will end up yeah. in the Rose Bowl, whether they're one or two. Yeah, I agree with you about the stadium. That wasn't a good look last night at all. I think that uh, when you look at the Ducks' defense, you know, they were really heavily criticized earlier in the season. The second half of the season, I think they started to figure out what their new defensive coordinator, Don Pelham, expected of them. They started to play great. And when you look at Marcus Mariota and his performance last night, it overshadows the great performance of that defense. They shut down Rich Rod's offense, that high-powered Wildcat offense. They went through three quarterbacks last night trying to get something going. So kudos to the defense, the Ducks. I know, I know everything's about Marcus Mariota in the offense, but the defense, they stepped up last night. That big time. That defensive line just dominated the line of scrimmage. Exactly. They didn't have a chance. So. O-line was very poor early. The yeah. good news is they have until January 1st to heal. Yeah. Andre Rudigiana, the tackle. Whoa. One, one, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. Rudigiana. You slipped him. that in there, didn't you? That was it. That was a <laughs> There's 25, there hey. 25 letters good. in that last name. He did it really fast. He's, he's a professional. He's showing off like, like his guy. How many times going on? Practice. Dropping dollars. <laughs>
many times you practice? Haters, that? haters, haters. Vienna. The, the, the point is, <laughs> he's got a knee, and, and he, he had yeah. crutches at the end of the game. You're hoping that he's had, he's had problems all year with injuries. You hope he can come back and be a part of it. Gressu, the center, they hope to have him back. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. whole bad. offensive line yeah. all year long has been banged up, yeah. and it's still just business as usual. All right. Let's see if... The Buckeyes can take care of business as usual. They are underdogs, and Lucas Oil has a scene of some bad memories. A 17-zip closing run by Michigan State. Ohio State losing a shot at the national title in the Rose Bowl last year. That heartbreaker, their only Big Ten loss in the last 25 games for Ohio State. But tonight, the 11-1 Bucks are underdogs to Wisconsin. They're the first team out of the current bracket. Who knows how much, if anything, they need to do to impress that committee other than just win. Certainly, the committee will watch how Cardell Jones, the third Ohio State quarterback, the third stringer at the beginning of the year, how he's going to look going into this game. He's 6'5", 250. You can see him leaping defenders. A very talented guy. Comes out of Glenville High School. Troy Smith's alma mater. Had plenty of reps in the spring with the first-team offense. Made his first time in the spotlight here. He had taken one snap in a game which Ohio State did not lead by 21-plus points until filling in for the injured um, Barrett against Michigan. So Quint Kesnick has seen Jones practice. He joins us now from Lucas Oil. Yeah, I was in Columbus on Monday and I got to watch Cardell throwing on the side some extra practice. It's undeniable. This kid's arm strength is ridiculous. He has an absolute cannon. Coach Urban Meyer really pleased with the progress and improvement that he's shown this week, specifically on Wednesday when they threw him some different looks. He showed command of the offense, the ability to change plays at the line of scrimmage, and he threw the ball down the field with a softer touch. Coach Meyer often likes to talk about sudden change and a team's reaction to an interception or a fumble. And this week, Ohio State dealt with sudden change of a different kind, the loss of starting quarterback J.T. Barrett and a first start for Cardell Jones. The thing that popped into my mind first was just that I hope he would get up. As Barrett still down for Ohio State. Boy, that looks bad. He's like, bro, it's bad. Just go win the game. And after that, I was like, Cordell, let's go, man. It's our time. He's a big physical dude. Uh, he has good feet. He kind of has that deceptive speed like JT and uh, this is a very powerful arm. The biggest thing for him is to just be comfortable, know that you got that offense full of weapons surrounding you and just play your game. He's walking into a different situation than JT did in August. You know, JT walked into a young, inexperienced, not very good offensive line. This guy's walked into a pretty good offensive line. The best way to indoctrinate a new quarterback is to have very good players around him. What are your expectations for him? To uh, lead Ohio State to a Big Ten championship. Here's what you're going to see today here in Lucas Oil. Meyer mentioned that last year they learned that the noise is intense here. You'll see the Buckeyes use their silent cadence. You'll also see Braxton Miller on the sideline and JT Barrett likely after surgery upstairs on the headset. Support system uh, around uh, Cardell Jones will be uh, completely intense, and, and these quarterbacks will be providing their, their leadership. Uh, and then lastly, Jalen Marshall get some snaps out of the Wildcats. Stephen Collier will be the emergency quarterback as they look to protect his red shirt. Chris, the big question, though, how will Cardell react to the pressure here? Urban Meyer says, I don't know. We're, we're going to find out, and, and I think that's the question on everyone's mind. Brent, thank you. Great stuff. Yeah, we're all going to find out. He came in on the same recruiting class as Braxton Miller, has waited for this moment to see what he can do against a Badger run defense that's pretty salty. Wisconsin, of course, had to make do without its starter, Joel Stavia, for about four and a half games. They've been 7-0 and since he's come back healthy and mentally right, and he's been converting uh, a lot on third down. That's a big part of it. Cardell Jones, it's funny to have an X factor. You play all these games, you get to this point, and now a guy who's never been in the position has to come through as quarterback. You know, the thing about Cardell Jones, he has a lot of weapons around him. Your hometown, he's a Cleveland guy. Yeah, he is. Cleveland, good. Ted Ginn Jr., yeah. Cleveland, Glenville, yeah, exactly. Dante, he has to, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so he comes from a, a high school where a lot of talent has pipelined to Ohio State. But I think that this is going to be probably one of Coach Urban Meyer's finest moments if he's able to pull off this victory. Going on his third quarterback, I think the, the, the silver lining is that they have a lot of weapons on the offense. Jones is not expected to shoulder the load, not to carry the offense, just distribute the ball to the playmakers and let them do what they do. Now he's six foot five, 250. When they run that read zone, man, those Wisconsin defenders, they're going to have a decision to make, a business decision. <laughs> business they're going to hit that big dude. <laughs> that, and I think that's the interesting part here is the zone read game at 6'5", 250. It's a tight end. 
running and keeping it as opposed to the quickness of a of Braxton Miller or JT Barrett. So I think you'll see at some point Jalen Marshall, who plays H-back, number 17, who's really come on this year for Ohio State, inserted to play some quarterback in that Wildcat package to get the explosiveness in there to mix up the looks. And, and remember, Jalen Marshall played high school quarterback. Very, very effective player in high school. Has moved to that slot receiver where he and Dontre Wilson have become those go-to receivers. But I, I think you'll see a mix. I don't think it's just going to be Cardell Jones. I think you'll see Jalen Marshall in there as well to provide, again, the big play spark. And Ezekiel Elliott one way or Jalen Marshall going the other. I think everybody talks about Urban Meyer as one of the best offensive minds in college football. Mm -hmm. He's going to prove it today. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, because you're talking about a situation where he's got to get to know a quarterback in a live, in live game where he doesn't know what he does well. He doesn't know what his strengths, what his weaknesses are. You can do it all day long in practice. Right. Or how back does, up right, right, right yeah. in the end of a game. But So how does, he, how does he perform in the moment? What does he do well? Urban, Tom Herman, they're going to have to earn their checks today because they're going to have to put him in a position to succeed. A big stage. One too. thing about Wisconsin's defense, and you look at their numbers, they're off the charts. They load the line of scrimmage. They play a ton of man-to-man. -man. Yep. And as a young quarterback, I'd rather face, with inexperience, I'd rather face man-to-man -man than zone. In zone, you've got to be able to differentiate, but where's the soft spot in the zone? You've got to anticipate more. Man-to-man, -man, it's like you guys playing turkey bowl with Jesse on Thursday, you know, getting ready to play. You're just winging it. Yeah. You're just, is he open? Throw it and make a play. You know, so I, I, think, I think the style of defense that he's defending is something that's very important and will help Cordell Jones play well. More on the line in this game than in the Turkey Bowl with the, the bragging rights. Well, no, I'm saying man to man. Yeah, no, yeah, I get you. Man to man. <laughs> man. We want the open throw it. I know what you mean. Schoolyard yeah. football. We want yeah, the ground. We want exactly. the yeah, exactly. Ball. Yeah. All right, well, much more in this game coming up. We'll, we'll talk more about the Badgers and what Melvin Gordon has to do and Des mentioned to make his closing statement. Like Ohio State, Missouri has a chance in a conference championship game to make amends for a loss last year. James Franklin and company against Auburn, they were in the mix as a three-point game, but they could not handle Trey Mason. 46 for 304 for Auburn last year. Missouri could not slow down an eventual Heisman finalist running back. Today, potential Heisman finalist and Belitnikoff favorite Amari Cooper is the mission here. Tigers are not really being given the typical division champ respect. They haven't been all year. Picked fourth in the East. They lost two jaw droppers at home to Indiana and Georgia, but they showed resolve on the road, created ways to win, even though they won the division without beating a single team that had an SEC winning record. That is remarkable. They're very comfortable as a two-touchdown underdog. Can they stun the tide and probably knock the SEC all the way out of the playoffs? They're going to have to have great play from a fast, nasty, and deep defensive line and need, and need much better playmaking from quarterback Matty Mock, really, than he's really shown all season long. Bama's defense, 630 yards, 44 points to Auburn last week. Few people are expecting a similar shootout this afternoon. The experts making this the lowest point total of any big game. Kaylee Hartung covering the SEC championship game from Atlanta and the Alabama Team Hotel joins us now. Good morning, Kaylee. Good morning, Chris. Now, Nick Saban told me that Blake Sims is at his best. He is his most focused when it's all on the line. You just have to go back to last weekend's Iron Bowl <laughs> to understand that. You may argue that Blake Sims put himself in a corner with the three interceptions that he threw, but after the third pick, Nick Saban went up to him and said, I'm with you. I want you in this game, but you have got to start making better decisions or else I'm going to have to make a change. Well, Blake Sims responded, lights out. He completed 10 of his last 12 passes, threw for three touchdowns, ran another one in, and of course, they got the win. Missouri saw that game, and they know that when the Tide and Blake Sims start rolling, they are hard to stop. The Iron Bowl scored 55 points. Being on defense, uh, it's a tall task for us to try and stop them. They're on the ball, big backs, you know, best wide receivers in the nation. Their quarterback's playing well. Sims wants Cooper. Cooper's got it. Touchdown, Alabama. Other than that, uh, you know, just it's an easy task. They don't give up a lot of big plays. I watched the Georgia game, and there was no play over 18 yards in the game, and Georgia seemed to be doing really okay against them. When the running backs get the ball, they swarm them with more than one guy because they're, they're both pretty big, talented, physical backs. So when it comes to stopping Amari Cooper, it's going to take several people. They beat you a lot with their quickness and penetration. It's going to be a real challenge for our offensive line to negate these guys' ability to impact and affect the game. 
Missouri's defensive bookends up front have combined for 22 sacks. That defensive line leads the SEC in that category. The good news for Alabama, Nick Saban says his left tackle, Cam Robinson, is good to go today. He sprained a shoulder last weekend, but he practiced through the week. If they are going to put up a fight against that stout Missouri defensive line, Cam Robinson will be a big help. Oh, Kaylee, thank you. Looks like Vogler, the tight end, also good to go for Alabama. We'll visit with Nick Saban coming up a little bit later on in college game day. Also, in Atlanta, just outside the Georgia Dome, where SEC Nation is set up on championship Saturday, Tim Tebow, who knows very well the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat in an SEC championship game. Tim, Missouri underdogs for a reason. What do you see from Matty Mock and that offense that they're going to have to do against Alabama to, to keep Tigers with a chance to win this game? Well, I, I think they're going to have to do three things. I think they're going to have to take vertical, sh vertical shots early and often because Alabama plays a lot of a combination coverage, meaning inside out, four over three, three over two. And the one way to get around that is to go vertical, vertical and take shots. Every team that has beat them since 2008 has taken vertical shots. Us when I was at Florida, Auburn, Johnny Manziel when he was at A&M, Bo Wallace earlier this year, you have to take vertical shots. The second thing you have to do is your QB he has to be able to run the ball. He has to be able to use his legs. Since 2008, teams that are 6-8 and eight when their quarterback has rushed for more than 30 yards. When they haven't rushed for more than 30 yards, they're 4-69. and 69. The QB has to be a threat with his legs. And Mat Matty Mock runs a 4-5, and he's athletic. He can make some plays with his legs. And last, they, ha they cannot turn the ball over. The Alabama has only lost one game when they've lost the turnover battle. They have to... Uh, Missouri has to win the turnover battle, and if they do those three things, they'll have a chance of pulling the upset. That's a good list, Tim. It's very tough to do those things, as you well know, against Alabama. Other big SEC news this week at your alma mater, where Jim McElwain introduced as the new Gators head coach. He's got Nick Saban ties, of course, four years as Alabama's offensive coordinator, a couple of national title rings, very quick rebuilding job at Colorado State the last few years, inherited three and nine, went 10 and two, Jeremy Foley, bringing him down, giving him a head coaching opportunity in the SEC. What are your expectations for McElwain? How big is the job to get the Gators back in that championship game in Atlanta? Well, I've talked to Mr. Foley, and he's super excited about it. He really liked his conversations with Coach McElwain. And Coach McElwain has a few things that you need to have when, you, when you're the head coach at the University of Florida. Because as the head coach at University of Florida, there is a lot of pressure, and you've got to be ready to handle that pressure. You've got to be ready to play in big games. Well, he's had a lot of pressure when he was the OC at Alabama, and he also knows what it means to rebuild a team when he went to Colorado State, and he re rebuilt that team, and they were 10-2 and two this year. And he's going to have to do a little rebuilding with Florida his offense so he's got the skills so we'll find out what happens you know Tim I, I think one of the things that had to be attractive to Jeremy is the co head coaching experience that, that Mac was able to gain out in Fort Collins and the job that he did there turning around the Rams program making them uh, more of what they used to be with Sonny Lubick I think that th this is a great fit because it's the first time Alabama or Florida is going to have a chance to recruit quarterbacks receivers running backs and offensive linemen and a very talent-rich state with high school football players to play an NFL style of offense. They, they've been running this system the last few years where they haven't been able to develop receivers, they haven't been able to bring in great quarterbacks, and I think now, with the exception of course of Tim, and now I think they're going to be able to go out there and bring in guys to run that style of offense. I think the biggest hire is who does he bring in as his defensive coordinator. Yeah. He is, he's one of these head coaches that's going to spend all of his time on offense. He's going to hand over the defense and say, you're in charge of the defense, see you Saturday. Who will that guy be? That's a good point because what I've heard about Coach McElwain is he loves to let his assistant coaches coach and he likes to get guys who have experience in multiple systems meaning that you're not just focused on one type of system you're very flexible he can get guys to play for him because he's not trying to tailor them just to one specific system. He wants to make the system specific to the talent that's around him. So he's not excuse oriented and he's very prepared. When you talk to his former players, they'll say even in defeat, we always felt as though we were better prepared. We may not have executed well enough to win that game, but Coach had us mentally prepared for anything that had happened on that field. I like what I'm hearing about Coach McElwain, Chris. I think this guy is a really good hire. That's a great thing for your former players to say. He always had us prepared. Exactly. Meanwhile, Nebraska, with a tweet Thursday, a surprise tweet, announced that Mike Riley, 
Comes from Oregon State. Two stints in Corvallis, totaling 14 years. Samus around three years for the Chargers. He takes over for Bo Pelini. One time he played quarterback for Paul Bryant. He's 62 years old when the season starts. He's been a West Coast guy basically his whole career, except when he went to Canada. So it's an interesting fit there. What, what do you make of Riley wearing that, that big red windbreaker in Lincoln uh, now? I, obviously, I think everybody was caught off guard, but I think he's a great coach. And, and, I, and I think it's a really good hire. When you look at coaches that fill vacancies of when fan bases didn't like him, remember, this is a fan base, they've won a lot. I, I mean, Bo Pelini won at least nine games a season. You've got to get a guy that's different. This is the anti-Bo Pelini. I mean, you talk about just his demeanor. Coach Riley is always composed. He's always under control. He's Tom Osborne. Yeah, and he, devel he develops That's quarterbacks. Sweet. He's done a great job there. And, and keep in mind, don't look at his record at Oregon State. That's the thing. Oregon State was horrible. He did a Bill Snyder type, type job. Seven of the 12 winning seasons at Oregon State in history is because of Riley. The reaction from people about, wow, well, Bo's been winning nine, and they went and got a guy that's not even winning, you know, having a, a winning record in his own conference. You, you obviously have not been following Mike Riley. This guy is one of the most undervalued head coaches in the country. He did as good a job as he could have in corporate ballast with the Ducks right down the road with Phil Knight. So give him all the credit for doing what he did while he was at Oregon State. He has a great tradition of being able to go to California and Texas and recruit. He can develop quarterbacks, again, yep. in a pro-style offense. So I think this opens up the door yep. for Nebraska in a very, very positive way. It's a great hire in my mind. I think it's a really good hire. You know, he has experience on the, both sides of the ball. He's coached offense. He's coached defense. He's coached in the NFL. So I think it's a really good hire. Obviously, they went totally opposite of what they had, had with Bo Pelini because, like, David said, this guy is the most even kill coach that you'll ever see. He's never high, he's never low, he's just always just flatlining for to speak. Osborne, yeah, I mean, the guys, Landry. I think they went yeah. the opposite direction. I do think he's an excellent coach, just a good hire. Get him excited. You mentioned Tom Osborne. Let's let's be clear. You're not saying he's going to have Osborne his, success. You just mean the demeanor. Yeah, his, his demeanor, disposition, the way he is, way he is on the sideline, exactly. you know, highs and lows. He just he's very chill. It's a different job than it was with Osborne too. This is a lot harder. No to doubt play. about that. You you mentioned both McElwain and Riley pro-style offensive schemes, a move away from hiring yeah. like spread guru zone read guys to, to run these programs yeah. and these offenses. Focus back now on the game here tonight. The last time K-State came here, they'd like to forget about it. Baylor with the spoilers. Nick Florence got him off going. Tevin Reese less than two minutes into the game. Florence would rush for another touchdown. The Bears up 28-7 against a K-State team that did not play well. Maybe felt the pressure. It was Baylor <laughs> celebrating. How did the Duke run center <laughs> Colin Klein had the worst game what? of the year. Well, he may have blown his Heisman hopes. He threw three interceptions. Baylor blew him out 52-24. Wow. Bears are 24-3 and three since that. Look at this scene on the banks of the Brazos as Samantha Ponder welcomes in Coach Art Bryles. Showing the legs here on game day. <laughs> Making me look soft. Come on, Samantha. Coach, you just hey. saw that aerial shot. Is this how you I picked mean, it up? Hey, we know. We know, we know in Waco, Texas, y'all know now, this is what we've been having for the last two or three years. You know, we're defending Big 12 champions, reigning Big 12 champions. We felt like this should have happened a year ago. We're glad that ESPN Game Day decided to come here today because this is a great day for Waco, Texas, and Baylor University, for the nation to see how much passion our student body has and our fan base. We need a pulpit up here. All right, Coach. <laughs> we got one. Let, let's talk about uh, your quarterback because a lot of questions about yeah. Bryce this week. He is cleared to play. How would you describe Bryce's preparation this week? Excellent. You know, I've been in the, in the room with him, been on the field with him. There's been no difference. He's a passionate leader. You know, he's only one of two quarterbacks in America to have a chance to repeat as champions. That says it all. The guy's going to fight for us tonight, and he's going to try to help us get another win. Was he limited at all this week in practice? I'm sorry? Was he limited at all no. this week well, in practice? Well, actually, we held him out a little bit Tuesday and Wednesday. Yesterday, he was full go. Or Thursday, he was full go. And now, you know, it's game time. So he's all that's cleared. He's just like he was a week, a week ago before anything happened. Coach, this entire week, and really this entire year, all the conversation has been about playoffs for good reason. I know the old quote by Al Davis, just win, baby. Coaches have said that all the time. All you have to do is win. Well, we've seen with Florida State, sometimes if you just keep winning, you might drop in the playoff committee poll right now. So in your mind, is just winning enough? You know, it always has been in my book. You know, that's the name of the game. That's why you play the game. You put two teams on the field, one of them wins, one of them doesn't. You know, the one that wins 
is the one that you look at as the winner. So that's that's what we're judged by. And I think, you know, we take care of business tonight against a really good Kansas State football team that's sitting with the same conference record that we have, 7-1. and one. I mean, they're shooting for the same thing we're shooting for. They were Big 12 champions in 2012. We were last year. So it's a great setup with two great football teams. One of us would be Big 12 champions tonight. I understand your point, Coach, when you say that's what you're judged by. But so far, the committee has judged that TCU should be ahead of Baylor, even though you won in the head-to-head -head matchup. <laughs> we hear the, the fans' response to that. What's your response to being behind, knowing that you beat them head-to-head? I, my response is, you know, I, I think the final poll is the only poll that counts. That's what I've heard since day one. The only poll that matters is the final poll that comes out tomorrow. We have a job to do tonight. That's to win this football game and repeat as Big 12 champions. Well, Coach, I think you could run for office in Waco right now, or maybe in Texas. Quite the enthusiastic crowd. We're really appreciative for your time today, and good luck in this game. We've got the best fans, the best, the best <laughs> alumni in the world. We love you, Baylor. Let's have a great night tonight, Baylor Bears. Come on, and let's get it back to back, back to back. Coach is going. Coach, coming up. We're going to have some other coaches in the playoff conversation. Interviews with Jimbo Fisher, Urban Meyer, Nick Saban, and the College Football Playoff Committee Chairman Jeff Long. And which Power 5 quarterback has the most interceptions? Yeah, that'd be Jameis Winston. A little Jameis conversation when we get back. Some great pictures here, courtesy of the Cheez-It Real Fan Cam and the best seats in the house. The fans in Section Zero. You all want to miss a lot more coming up on College Game Day. Aerial coverage provided by Goodyear. Whether you're going for it from a few yards out or from miles away, go with a tire with superior performance. Goodyear, more drift. physical we play fast I mean the way we spread it out it puts a lot of stress on a lot of defenses they do a lot of zone read plays and make sure that everybody bites in on the run and then they try and hit you with that pass another touchdown for Baylor oh my Bryce Petty what a play by Bryce Petty he's hungry he's determined he's not satisfied he's got a wheel and a drive to succeed whether it's the defensive ends, the linebackers hitting the gaps hard, just trying to disrupt him, take him off his game, maybe talk a little smack. You're watching them each and every week just to see what they're doing to other teams and make sure that you're not one of those teams at the end of the year that they score 60 on. That's three huge heady pass plays that helped Baylor win despite having the ball just 20 minutes against K-State last year in Manhattan tonight in primetime on ESPN. Brad Nessler and Todd Blackledge on the call here from beautiful McLean Stadium. Talked about the hit that Bryce Petty took against Texas Tech. This is Sam McGuire for the Red Raiders, a dirty shot. Boom, crown of the helmet right upside Petty's cheek. He got knocked out of the game. The Bears had to hold on for a two-point win, stopped a conversion. Petty has a freeze frame of that shot on his phone, helmet to helmet. Art Bryles just said, as Todd joins us now, that Petty is as good as he was before that hit. Quarterbacks who have taken shots might, <laughs> might debate that. He also told me yesterday, Bryles, they will not call protections or pass plays to protect the quarterback. But what's it like coming back a game after a shot like that? Well, I, that's the unknown, you know. I mean, I think that he'll still be ready to play. He had a great week. Talked with him yesterday. He seemed great. Felt good. My only question is, how's he going to feel the first time he gets hit again? You know, if he gets a hard shot in the game, which Kansas State's a physical, rugged defense, they're going to get some shots on him. That's that's the big question I have. How does he feel after he gets hit a couple times? This system has just been amazing to watch and watch it grow from RG3 to where they are now with Bryce Petty. I think nationally, people get caught up in the quarterback and the receivers in the vertical passing game, but Todd, as you know, I mean, they, they are so balanced and so physical with the way they're able to run with Shaq Linwood. So, so they stretch you out horizontally. They create vertical seams in their passing game. And I think the difference with Bryce, just like any quarterback, is he has seen almost every defense and every style to try to defend this explosive attack, and he finds matchups. He'll, he'll look for matchups tonight against Bill Snyder's defense, a defense that's kind of trying to avoid those big plays, but with a veteran quarterback in this system, boy, they are tough to Stop. And you know the thing about this system and Bryce Petty and when he's on this offense is virtually unstoppable. Yeah. I was here for the 
TCU game. Mm. You know, they, they made up ground in the fourth quarter. They gained almost 800 yards of offense, and, and TCU had no answer for him in the fourth quarter. So when he's on, because of their balance, their ability to run, and when they go tempo, they don't just dink it. They uh, look to throw the absolutely. ball down the field. Yep. That, that makes them a really dangerous offense to defend. Especially at home. Tempo yeah. works yeah. better at home, right? Yeah, and, no and doubt. Much better quarterback statistically at home. By the way, trying to come back from a concussion and play well the next week, RG3 did it. It was three years ago. Texas Tech knocked him out with a concussion. RG3 came back the next week, ran for two through for two against Texas, won the Heisman Trophy the following week. It's still pretty rare, though. How he plays is going to be interesting. NFL, since the start of 2012, two of 16 quarterbacks who had concussions actually came back and played the following week. RG3 was one of them. We, we've ta all talked to him this week. I yeah. mean, th there's no way he's not playing right. in this game. Oh, no, no. Bryce no. Petty will be out there. I think he'll play really well. How well will Jameis Winston play in the game that we're going to call tonight in Charlotte against Georgia Tech? Winston, more first-half picks than any FBS quarterback. 14 of them through four against the Gators. He's still 25-0 as a starter. He's earned a lot of support from his teammates. Jimbo Fisher, regardless of what Jameis does, relentlessly defends his guy, but they want better things from him tonight. Winston rolls in the end zone. Picked off again. A third pick in the first quarter. Sometimes that happens. I mean, it's just a bad game. He's actually, besides last game, I mean, that was the only poor game he's played. The rest of them, he's played outstanding football. Winston throwing into traffic, and he throws another interception. Two interceptions thrown by Jameis Winston here in the first quarter. I thought he's actually been maybe more outstanding in the fact that he's had to overcome so much more with youth around him and being on the road and being, be able to bring us back and keep his fortitude and put his will in the other guys. And I think that's why we are where we are right now as much as anything. 125 yards, Kirk, against the Gators, the game we saw. Fisher says he's practiced well. We'll talk later about what's been on Winston's mind off the field this week. What are your expectations? Well, tonight? you and I called the, the Florida, Florida State game last week, and he has a look in his eyes. It's either one extreme or the other. He, at times in the first half, looks as almost as if he's in a fog. And then in the second half, he's decisive. He makes quick decisions. He, he's accurate with the ball, and he has a command of the offense. Well, last couple weeks, we've not seen him flip that switch. We saw it for a couple series where he found Nick O'Leary for a couple touchdowns, but we've not seen that ability of him to flip the switch, Todd. Now, Jimbo said this week it's the best he's looked all year as far as practice. They had some late practices because of the hearing. I just wonder, if, is, is it something going on that, that's finally taking a toll on him that's affecting him emotionally? We all buy in that he's a great quarterback and, and he can read coverage, but is there more going on and can he snap out of it for this ACC championship? Well, that, that's a great question. I think he's going to have to snap out of yeah. it. I think he's got to have that switch on right away in this yeah. ballgame because I think Georgia Tech's offense will create a lot of problems for Florida State's defense, and Jameis Winston needs to play like the, the reigning Heisman trophy winner he needs to have a great ball game from start to finish and take this team and put it on his back tonight if he doesn't they got a great chance of getting beat and that georgia tech defense in the last five games they're on fire as far as creating turnovers coming up with interceptions ted roof who was at penn state first year as a defensive coordinator it's a different defense with georgia tech here in the second half so they've been opportunistic so if they get the ball back to that offense yeah. You're right. He better be ready to roll early. Yeah, different deal when you face a team that if you don't make a third and four, the other team's going to get the ball maybe for five and or six like, minutes. <laughs> and you right. won't see it again. Right. Yeah. Something else we're going to watch tonight. When he targeted Green or O'Leary last week, yeah. seven of ten, two touchdowns. When he targeted everybody else on that team, four of 15 and four picks. So can he spread the ball around? With other you know they'll build their play. plan around that. You've got to have a plan for those two. This is an audible. I don't know if you were expecting this, but <laughs> everybody's fitting, been saying... It's a fitting audible. Yeah, it's a fitting <laughs> audible. Your, your four teams, as we sit here right now, and you're, you're going to call the, the Baylor oh, chance to make their closing statement against K-State. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. On the spot. And don't play What's to the your, crowd. Just, you know, what do you think? Okay, here's what I think. Yeah. If Baylor wins the game tonight, yeah. Baylor's my fourth team. Okay. okay. <laughs> You know, and I have an, a unique perspective because I was here for the Baylor TCU game. I watched that game. I watched Baylor roll almost 800 yards of offense, over 60 points. I think the head-to-head -head means a lot. I think it's a huge factor. I saw Ohio State twice. The first time I saw them, they were below average against Virginia Tech. Then I saw them against Penn State. They were a little bit better than that, and I know JT Barrett was a little banged up. They've gotten better. They're a good football team, but based on what I've seen, if, if things, if, if Baylor wins tonight, Baylor's my fourth team, and the other three are, are pretty set. 
That's a popular opinion here. Have a great time tonight, Thank Thank Brad. We appreciate Thank that. You. And sprint off and get your preparation done on the sneakers. <laughs> they got could, sneaks could not on. let that go. I didn't know you were wrong with the sneaks in the suit. <laughs> have, to. have to. All right, a lot more coming up from the banks of the Brazos here in this, this great scene. We'll circle back to all the games we've talked about. Nick Saban will join us coming up. Gary Patterson will join us. And always get to boo here in Waco. A lot more coming up. Coke Zero for giving his section zero. Are they counting down to kick off here? And welcome back to Waco, Texas. College Game Day's first visit here. The Brazos River, the bridge that separates the stadium from football facilities and other parts of the campus. They are jazzed up for the primetime ESPN collision. The top 10 matchup in the Big 12. Winner gets a share of the conference crown. The Frogs, TCU, a reference to about 700 signs here. I can grab another piece of it. A noon ABC game up the road in Fort Worth against Iowa State. It's a great new tradition here, at least new to this stadium. These are the freshmen sprinting out to form a human tunnel to both the Baylor Bears on. They call it the Baylor line. They're That's awesome. Jerseys. It is tremendous. And the team comes running out. They got pyrotechnics. They got flames. And then the other great part of this, after Baylor takes the field, the freshmen with that class of 2018, they take their seats. They go sprinting across those yellow seats on the far side. I mean, of how the good is spot. that? That's right. right behind the visiting right bench, the by the way. Yeah. Right behind the bench. Yeah. Prime seats. These are the, uh, either the seniors in their final home game get this honor, or the freshmen get the best. How about the tonight? freshmen getting the best? I never heard of that. Me neither. That is unusual. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> never finished right. your first year, as they say here in Baylor. <laughs> Meanwhile, coming up on College Game Day, much more in the Big Ten. Cardell Jones and the Buckeyes trying to knock off the Badgers as underdogs in Indy. Perhaps punch their ticket. Nick Saban will join us as the Tide gets set to take on the Tigers in rainy Atlanta for the SEC title. We'll ask him if the Tide need to win to get in. That's been somewhat controversial. And we'll visit with Jeff Long. Who gets a boo here for now because his committee has <laughs> Baylor ranked number six. <laughs> Let's talk about the issues in play here. In Fort Worth, Coke Zero counting us down to kick off the beloved Horned Frogs. Ooh. There's some animosity that goes back many <laughs> decades between these two schools. This isn't a thing about a three-point win or a playoff position. They don't like each other for a long time, Baylor and TCU. But Iowa State... About a five touchdown dog against TCU. You better be ready today. Got to be ready. The games that are on tap here, Alabama and Missouri. It's a matinee on CBS. ABC primetime game, Florida State and Georgia Tech from Charlotte, Wisconsin and Ohio State. Fox has that tonight. We talked about the ESPN primetime showcase, K-State and Baylor, a very energized stadium here. And Fresno State and Boise State trying to be in position get one of those New Year's Six Bowl bids. Well, we've talked about this brave new system already. People are saying four isn't enough. We're going to have an eight-team bracket. That's a conversation for another day. Will it make the regular season less impactful? I don't think so. You look at the chase run down here, more games than ever involved, teams from all different regions, fan bases in Waco, aware of what's going on, not just up the road in Fort Worth, but in Charlotte and in Indy and in Atlanta and places like that. There's been a world record already set for hot air on this topic in the media with more to come when the uh, announcements made in about uh, 26 hours from now the final four bracket we've set ourselves up to come down to a one game season trying to prove that um, we belong with the nation's elite in college football you got to let your team speak whether it's baylor gets in or tcu gets in or ohio state gets in we got to go finish our journey and then we got to see how it happens every red flag's up you know, every excuse is out there to not play well, to not win a game, to lose a game, and there's not good fortune. The ball didn't bounce your way. We don't believe in that. When you're in the playoffs, which we're in the playoffs right now, you don't get to play anymore unless you win this game. So to think about anything beyond that is absolutely crazy. Get back to perception. You got to say one conference is better, but I don't think it's that drastic. I think everybody can beat anybody in college football right now on any given Saturday. You know, if we repeat as Big 12 champions, I mean, what, what more can you do when everybody's shooting at you the entire year? If you can come out victorious, taking everybody's best shot, then what other style points or publicity do you need? Everybody wants to put the cart before the horse. 
We gotta finish this journey. You can't control all the rest of it. Folks, you're having fun. The bodies of work. Trials on the left, <laughs> Patterson on the right. All photoshopped. Oh, <laughs> Say, how about how about the Reverend Riles getting up there and inspiring the he congregation did. in the <laughs> pulpit? Can I get an amen? An amen, brother. <laughs> Baptist school. Exactly. Like Old school the Baptist. Party. Exactly. Right. Well, the playoff contenders are favored between four points for Florida State and 34 and a half at TCU, except for Ohio State, which is an underdog with the uncertainty about the quarterback position there. We'll talk much more again about all of these games. And Mr. Corso is back here. Yes. Welcome, welcome back to Waco. We'll talk about the question marks that we have involving the contending teams. Is it a player? Is it a unit? What, what jumps out at you as a question mark? For me, it's Wisconsin, their offensive line. Now, they're, they're coming into this game with an injury to their center, Dan Volz. So they may have to play a freshman named Michael Dieter. Now, the problem is, you talk about a game within the game, the strength of Ohio State's defense is right there in the interior alignment. They have some defensive tackles who are great run stoppers, and they can push the pocket, especially Adolphus Washington. If you're going to have a true freshman, not only snapping the ball, but now he's got to go up against the big bodies that Ohio State's going to bring in that front seven. I think that's going to be a problem. So that's a matchup to watch. Yeah. Wisconsin's offensive line, the interior of the offensive line, against Ohio State's defensive line. That's Kirk. a good one. Michael Bennett in there along with Washington. Yeah. If, he's still, if Volts can't go, that's a big concern. I, my big question mark about today would be Alabama. Does Alabama's fans, and more importantly, the players, respect Missouri? Are they just going to show up to Atlanta today and just kind of punch their ticket and get, uh, move on to the Final Four and into, the, into a playoff? Or are they going to show up with an eye of the tiger and with some determination? Nick Saban on his radio show this week cautioned the fans, respect Missouri, be ready to go. You can only imagine what he's doing behind closed doors to his team to make sure they respect Missouri. Missouri just doesn't sound like a team that you're going to play in a championship game. Although. I believe that Gary Pinkle, second year in a row, getting his team into the SEC championship game, Bama better respect them yeah. because this is the best defensive line, not in the SEC, in the country that Alabama is getting ready to face. Well, they're tough. And the biggest question mark I have is Florida State's defense against Georgia Tech's flex yeah. bone offense. Yeah. Tech is nationally ranked rushing and time of possession. And that means how many will Florida State get the ball enough to outscore the Tech? My, my question is this. Watch out. This is a voodoo game for Florida State. Another voodoo game. Another he, voodoo he, game. He, he, he's been doing Definitely. that for a month. Yes, he, has. he went from UCLA to Florida State. Very consistent with that. <laughs> they, 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 might not, they might not get the ball enough to outscore those guys. I'm telling you, they it's did, a big problem. They had like eight possessions against the Citadel who ran the same kind of offense. I tell you that's what, a big part of Georgia Tech's plan. Yeah. Just keep Jameis Winston on the that, sideline. That's right. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. Now, this is uh, the first time that the Bedlam rivalry, they're still playing. The Sooners and the Cowboys are playing, but it's the first time in five years that there's no Big 12 title implications. You got a quarterback matchup we would not have foreseen at the beginning of the season. You got you know, Cody Thomas for Oklahoma. Mason Rudolph is a true freshman quarterback for Oklahoma State. So a bonus surprise. You didn't expect it. You no. don't see it coming. No, we got to mention Bedlam once in the show. Predictions. Yeah, from here. we've come one. a long way with Bedlam. Uh, <laughs> we used to be there. With yes, Bedlam. we did. Just recently. I, I'm going to I'm going to go with Oklahoma. Yeah. I, I think Oklahoma gets it done. What do you Oklahoma, have? Oklahoma State's lost five games in a row. Make it six. Oklahoma's going to win this game I by an average you. of 27. You did your research, even though you weren't expecting the Bedlam, but he knew it. That's thank you. Yeah. Impressive. <laughs> I, I, I got I got the Sooners. The Sooners yeah. big too. The, yeah. the first uh, game for Samaji Piran since the 427 yeah. you can see a record against Kansas. One of Baylor's non-conference opponents is winless SMU. Last chance for the Ponies to get a win at UConn. They got one FBS win in the Yakos first season. Dallas native Chad Morris returning home as the next SMU coach. He ran Clemson's offense. He was a high school coach. This is an offense that needs a <coughs> massive rebuilding <laughs> job. Deion Sanders Jr. Kickoff returner. One of the few bright spots for SMU to illustrate the magnitude of the rebuilding job. Since 2004, 1,323 teams have played FBS football. That's where SMU 2014 ranks in, in those categories. Now, Chad Morris is an offensive spread guru guy. He's got a big, big job. Yeah. 
just for the people here who know SMU, that's part of that Baylor non-conference schedule that gets criticism from us and from a lot of people. Pony's last chance, and no one wants to see anybody go winless. It's College football can be tough when you don't win a game. Yeah, you hate to see that happen, especially for the kids. But, yeah, they will be winless. I got UConn. I'm picking UConn. Not enough talent for SMU. I'm picking UConn by five three-point baskets. Five, three, three. They, they, uh, they didn't have it last. They lost last They night. lost the basketball. Now we got, Yale. A, we got a nooner in the rain. <laughs> they lost two in a row. I know. Yale I beat them. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Lost to That's Yale. That's another story. Now we got a nooner at the rent today. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, where they're not expecting, a, I think, four to 5,000. I think Bob Diaco will find a way to oh. get it done. It might be dark already there. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold and dreary there. A nooner at the wrench, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a big game. Oh, oh man. I just, there's no sentimental people no. up here. No. SMU. No. Yeah, that was tough. For the state of Texas. Yeah, Wouldn't that be something? Rent? Yes. Yeah. Shout out to Dion, though. His son's balling. Yeah. Yeah. You Prime said you don't time. cover all the bases here. The wrench and Nooner, Morris likely to inherit a 14-game loser. But a great place to start coaching. That's right. No Turn wins. Around. Expectations uh, are expect very low. The bar is low. Very low. No. Exactly. Good point. They got some pockets. Yeah, they're they pretty deep, deep at SMU. Sure oh yeah. We'll yes, see if he, he can work those high school recruiting grades, get something going at SMU. Move on to more relevant teams. Much more coming up on College Game Day for the first time since '95. Though a major college football program is being canceled. Gene Wojciechowski and the financial reality and the raw emotions colliding at UAB. TCU Baylor among the debates inside that committee room. We'll visit with Jeff Long, committee chairman, coming up on College Game Day. And Mr. Corso's gone with 51 different headgear selections through the years. Will the Bears make it 52, or is it going to be Willie the Wildcat? A vote for the AARP. The bear in the boat and on top of the canoe. Good stuff here. Wow. Aerial coverage brought to you by Goodyear. Whether you're going for a few yards out for a long distance, go with a tire that's proven performance. Good year for Driven. <laughs> Number three. Wow. The Horn Frogs of TCU. This is yeah. an absolute yeah. joke yeah. of a farce, of a disgrace. Now you have three one-loss teams ahead of unbeaten Florida State. The object of the game is the win. It's not fake escape. <laughs> Is it possible FSU could get left out? We think being undefeated is everything. It's important. It's really important. It's not everything. Man, TCU getting ranked ahead of Florida State, and Florida State jumping out to four? Stop making it sound like the difference between three and four is the Grand Canyon. I think TCU's really good. I also know that Baylor beat them. I'm not sure a championship team gives up 24 points with nine minutes to go. They went on the field. They settled it, and the committee decided... Nah, 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 nah. What country do we live in? I think it's America. That's kind of always been the America way. If there's a conflict or a doubt, you put two people in the ring, they fight. When the BCS was dumped, people said, oh, but we love the debate. We love the controversy. Like that was going to go away with the four-team playoff. Sunday, 1230 Eastern time, the selection show will reveal the selection committee's final four bracket. That'll happen in the first half hour of the show. Then there'll be a couple more hours to digest all of the other bowl matchups. That is the bracket as it stands entering championship Saturday. The committee gathered just up the road, Metro Dallas in Grapevine, Texas, making it impossible to avoid quoting the classic line, heard it through the grapevine, just about to lose my mind as we bring in Jeff Long of Arkansas, the selection committee chairman. Jeff, thanks for taking time. Before we get to some of the questions, you may not be the most popular man, by the way, here in Waco with your committee ranking the Bears at number six. But set the scene for us today as your committee watches the last puzzle pieces fall into place. Well, we'll convene. Uh, when I get off the air with you, we'll convene and we'll talk about last night's game and then we'll go through some a few scenarios and then prepare for the uh, games beginning at 11 a.m. here and going into uh, late in tonight with the uh, Mountain West Championship or the Mountain West Championship game. So we're prepared for a long day of being together and watching football. Jeff, whether it's intended or not, the collective thinking of the committee has proven to be different than it was in the poll era. 
the pole air was never very fluid in the final weekend. If you won and you were up there, you generally stay there. How fluid do you think the committee will be in relation to what we've seen in decades past in the sport? Well, I think we're very different than the polls, and the way we go about our rankings is very different. So, you know, it's hard to predict what, how fluid we'll be, but I, I certainly think it'll be more fluid than what we've seen in the past. You know, the difference is we get together, we discuss, and we debate, and we watch the games, and we've been asked to look deeper than just the one loss record. So uh, I think it is quite different because the process is quite different. Obviously, here in the state of Texas, the hot topic is the head-to-head -head win by Baylor here over TCU by three points. In general terms, how do you frame that debate between things like the body of work and the eye test, phrases that you've used and are harder to understand, versus the head-to-head? -head? How do you frame that debate that's going on in there? We'll go on. Yeah, the, the, the criteria says to us that when all things are equal, teams are uh, indiscernible that the head-to-head -head comes into play so at this point in time the committee has felt like TCU is ahead of uh, Baylor and that that head-to-head -head has not come into play yet but you're using the, the, the phrase yet and those folks didn't hear that because they're booing but but you said that it is fluid it is different than the polls so it's likely to be the liveliest conversation, would you say, if both TCU and Baylor win for this committee, do you think, uh, later today? I, I think it'll be lively conversation. The thing you have to remember is we will have a uh, full body of works for the entire season for all the games, and we'll have the champion's name. So those are key pieces for us, and it will, it will be a lively debate, no question. Jeff, you talked a lot about the importance of the end of season and winning a conference championship. This is uh, somewhat hypothetical, but I think you know where I'm going. Would you foresee a situation where a team could lose its conference championship game, Alabama, for example, and still be considered by the committee as one of the four best teams? Well, again, that depends on what else happens in these championship games. So I would say it's not impossible, but it's hard for us to project out without knowing the other results of other games. Absolutely. That, that's a fair answer. And if the, some of those teams do stumble and Alabama stumbles, that'll be a big debate. Jeff, you know you got a big job ahead of you. Thank you very much for your time this morning from Grapevine, Texas. All right, guys, what, what, do, you, what do you think? I mean, uh, pretty much as a, as a selection committee chairman would, would, would expect to be, you know, yeah. framing things. They, they're, they're, still, they're still ornery here, though. Yeah, and, and he said yet, and I'm glad you yeah. picked up on that, which is, which is interesting because they've talked about it. The body of work is not complete. And... When you're comparing Baylor and TCU, I, I understand the outrage, but they got a top 10 chance right now. They got to beat this team first before these resumes are complete, and then you start saying head to head matters the most. This, this, this from, from the time Baylor beat Oklahoma, I think a lot of us just assumed that eventually Baylor would go by TCU at the end of the year, assuming they won out. The reason this thing lost momentum is because of last week. Whether you like to admit this or not, when you give up 700 yards to Texas Tech, that's going to influence the committee, and that's when they're evaluating the body of work. So if they would have blown Texas Tech out, I really believe, Des, that it, they would get a chance today, knock off Kansas State, and then flip over top of TCU. Now, with a three to a six, I don't even know if it matters what they do in this game. I don't think they're going by TCU. I agree with you, but I think that um, when you, you said this for about three weeks now, style points matter, and they knew that coming to the Texas Tech game. So winning by two points didn't help their cause at all. I just thought when you knocked Florida State down to number four and put TCU at three, then you make it extremely difficult, no matter what happens here at Baylor, for them to leapfrog TCU. Why? I, don't, I agree with you. Why is it then you have to leapfrog Ohio State, Florida State, and TCU. I don't see them doing that. Now, if TCU was at four and Florida State was at three, then it's more, I think, feasible for them to leapfrog TCU. Just a question real quick. We, we talk about style points. What about TCU versus Kansas? I know. I mean, that, that's, that's also a game that we're sitting there you're going, I think, what the heck just happened? TCU's one of the best teams yep. in the country. They should stomp out. You know, I, and I think that's where the door really, that's where the momentum started to swing in their favor here at Baylor. Right. And then, and then I think they hurt themselves last week. The one thing to remember is I hear all about this is American, you know, head to head <laughs> can matter. One thing to remember about that, in 2008, when OU played Texas and OU ended up uh, losing to Texas, the final vote by Art Bryles, now he said he didn't vote. 
This is coming. Art Briles' vote had Texas at number five and Oklahoma at number one. So, that, and, and the, Texas beat them. So, you know, we can talk all we want about head-to-head, -head, but that, that was a different set of circumstances, right. evidently, in 08. I don't know all about that, but I'm old-fashioned enough. Mm -hmm. Baylor beat TCU right. on the field. Yep. Bottom line. Yep. They beat him. It's like a heavyweight championship fight. If one guy beats the other guy, he's the heavyweight he champion, right? right? Yep. That's it. No, what I don't understand is why are they waiting for that to kick in? Yeah. No, when, when Alabama sat at number five, Mississippi State was number one, and they beat Mississippi State, they didn't keep Alabama at five. They moved them up to number one because they beat them head to head that week. So why are you waiting because now the to not use even this? Close. The resume's not the same. Right. And the resume's not even close. That's why they're not close right now. But what, that shouldn't matter if you're just going week to week who wins games. You know what I mean? Like, why are you waiting to the end to use the head-to-head? -head? Well, to me, the they're, they're, they're saying resume it didn't matter. Resume. Resume. Potentially, this win over Kansas State, which the committee has, yeah, what, sure. very high in the top ten, yeah. is the best thing with Von Baylor's resume, as well as the TCU wins. So yeah, so saying. obviously it would matter. You, you add another notch on your belt to beating a top ten team, then you start to start look at their resumes, and they become yeah. very similar. We didn't ask Jeff about it, because I think the assumption is that even though they keep winning and keep dropping yeah, that Florida please, State sitting please. there at number four yeah. if they beat Georgia Tech and, and win the ACC title there's no way you can exclude them what was your reaction when you saw them at number four though wait I mean, number one <laughs> they're the number one team in the nation for one reason they won all their games and that's pretty tough to do because nobody has done it except Florida State right so is right. there too much of a concern with resume and style points in yes. this new era and there's, a, there's a new resume thing it's called quality loss they need a quality loss to move up. Exactly. In fact, I'm worried, well, I'm worried yeah. if they win, they're going to move to number five. The close wins aren't working. No. They need a quality loss. They need okay. a quality right. loss. Well, I, the, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, but yeah. I, I don't think they should be number one because I think you also have to talk about quality wins. And I, I think Florida State deserves a lot of credit, and they is, there is no way they should be out of the top four. They there, won't be. No way. It, should, yeah. it, it, would, it, would be, it would be criminal if they're out of the top four. But they haven't looked like the best team in the country. And if we go back to the BCS era, 2012, if we have another situation like that where you have a team like Notre Dame that runs the table, but you clearly see that it's not one of the best teams in the country, do you want that team in a Final Four? Or do you want the Would four best Would you put Florida team? State in that category with the Notre Dame? No, you would never put Come Florida on. State in Notre that Dame Notre category. Put, category. put them in the category because yeah, yeah. you don't have a dominant team, though. You know what I mean? They may not be the best-looking team, but we don't have a dominant but they, team. But that's the same team. I'm saying in the category, they flirted with teams that weren't very, gr weren't very good. And that's what Florida State's oh. done. We, we, we've seen them six times. If Florida State's one of the best four teams in the country. Oh, I think, I think they are. Yeah. yeah, without Easy. a doubt. Let's if go they win, let's go. they're in. They're fine. Easy. But Chris Felica, we went to Miami. I don't know if it's apropos or not, but everybody's worried about agendas and potential agendas, perceived agendas. Yeah. You don't think Florida State, Chris Felica, as you sit there, belongs in the bracket undefeated? Oh, no, I, they absolutely do. Oh, okay. But, uh, what, what I'd like to point out with what David was talking about, the 2012 Notre Dame thing, if you compare the resumes and you're, you're saying uh, that they weren't even close, Notre Dame had a better resume than Florida State did uh, this year. Notre Dame in 2012, I'm reading right here, their strength of record was one, seventh in the, in the game control. I know you don't want to look at it. Yeah, strength yes. of schedule was 12, much better. Notre Dame was more impressive than Florida State was this year. But Florida State absolutely has nothing to worry about. They're in. If they win today, they're in. Hey, Chris, you talk about Notre Dame and Florida State. 1993 was another example of a head-to-head. -head. We, we were there the very first yes. college game day. Florida State beat, you know, or lost to Notre Dame head-to-head -head yes. on the field. Head-to-head -head didn't seem to matter to the pollsters who gave the, the Knowles the national championship over Notre Dame. Chris, another examples of a head-to-head -head when it hasn't been as important in the BCS era anyway. Well, the 2000 Miami, Florida State, the 2008 Oklahoma, Texas. I mean, 78, you had what, Alabama and USC where the loser wound up winning uh, the yep. AP national title as well. There have been a few. So it hasn't always been the end all. What's your top four before we go? You get Florida State, number one. Oregon, number two, because he lost the number eight team. Alabama's number three because he lost to the 14th team. And the best team I've seen this year, Ohio State. Best team I've seen. Best team I've seen in person okay. was Ohio State that night <laughs> against Michigan State. <laughs> I would have Bama, Oregon, Florida State, and TCU going into today. And the, the asterisk with Ohio State, I'm anxious to see how they play without yep. JT Barrett. If, if they play well, you know, this TCU Baylor debate maybe yeah, is moot, maybe. and Ohio State moves Definitely. into four. That's true, too. I would have Alabama, Florida State, Oregon, and probably TCU. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, I have the same, but I would have Baylor in the fifth spot. I would have exactly. Baylor right behind TCU, yep. and then if they beat 
the number they 9 team in the country. Leapfrog. They have a chance to move up to the number What's well, interesting, if they're not upsets and Ohio State okay. does win, that would be a mild upset over Wisconsin. The question is, and you guys have both alluded to it, zero potential Big 12 teams in that bracket if Ohio State moves up. The other scenario is, if there are upsets, would the committee consider having both. two Ooh. Big yeah. 12 teams, yeah. Yeah. both Baylor wow. and TCU, Possible. if wow. there's carnage in front of them? If Ohio Which, State and Florida State were to lose, that's a pretty much a slam dunk. Hey, how about both this? Of them would be in. If yeah. Alabama lose, we yeah. have no SEC teams in it. Yeah. 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 We're going to ask Sam about that. <laughs> Mr. Hey, Mr. SEC <laughs> Pollock, Alabama loses a conference championship yeah. game, neutral field, two touchdown underdog Missouri. Was Missouri have a better case than Alabama? Does Alabama have no case in the playoff? Apple Missouri ball? has no case regardless. No case regardless. You lost to Indiana. And, and you got, but what about and Alabama? You, and you got beat 34 to nothing. You, no, no, no. You would have no just beaten Alabama. Alabama has a better That's case the, than Missouri. Awesome. Thank you. That was a great job. But you got stomped out by Georgia and you neither got beat team. by Indiana. Neither team has no team. No, no. And then no that's case. the big controversy. The SEC will want a team in there. If they don't get one, they'll boot. Eight teams. They this year. Eight teams <laughs> playoff this year. Well, yeah, next year. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to change it right now. <laughs> they wouldn't deserve a team in there. That's just the way it is. Isn't this more fun than just two teams? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chaos. Oh, eight yeah. teams would yeah. be more fun than four, but eight, it's, it's pretty good. Look at this. They want chaos. They yeah, want they chaos. Got, they they, they got it, too. They got it. In they a big way. Chaos. This seems pretty chaotic, so I guess they, <laughs> <laughs> they want to... Lots of opinions. Coming up, more on College Game Day. We talked about Saban and getting involved in his conversation. And, and, and Gene Wojciechowski has the story of a team that's not in the conversation of the playoff bracket. But, Gene, it's a story of a power and politics and money in UAB that may have a very sad ending for them. Well, Chris, this should be a time of celebration for UAB football. They're bowl eligible for the first time since 2004. Home attendance has more than doubled since last year. And yet, UAB coaches are looking for new jobs, and the players are looking for new teams, all because of a decision that blindsided a program that thought it had finally turned the corner. We have made the decision that the 2014-15 academic year will be our final year of competition in football, rifle, and bowling. We just come from meeting with our coaches and students and sharing this information with them. As you might imagine, a great deal of passion and emotion was exhibited. I have a wife, two-year-old son. My son asked me last night, Daddy, what are they going to do with that program? Are you telling me because the numbers didn't look right? It's 18-year-olds in here, 17-year-olds. What are they supposed to do? UAB President Ray Watts helped pull the financial plug on football, saying the school could no longer sustain the cost of the program. Rumors had become reality, and reality became rage. This guy had three surgeries last year. I can't tell you how many surgeries this people this have gone through, man, to play for this team, to put all these colors, to put this emblem and represent college football. It was beyond tough. I mean, these are guys that are your family, and, uh, you know, I was just, it's really hard to put into words, really. It isn't hard to put into words for Birmingham businessman Don Heyer, who has donated millions of dollars to UAB and vows to withhold millions because of the decision to end football. I've never been uh, more ashamed, more embarrassed in my whole life of uh, a group of administrative people who had the ability to do something better than what we did that day. I feel so sorry for those players. It, it was unreal just to see so many grown men break down and cry and, and to see his reaction or lack of reaction, it was, it, it turned your stomach. It almost made you wonder, you know, you know, if you really care. If I had that to do over again, I would give anything to have the opportunity to really share heart to heart what this means to both of us and share our disappointment to one another. Three days before the program was eliminated, the Blazers beat Southern Miss for their sixth win, tripling its total of a season ago. This is going to be his fourth return for a touchdown, and that'll tie the NCAA record. I'm thinking, like, if we win this game, we can save our program. We can go to a bowl game. We can put our school on the map. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we had kind of, you know, had an idea that, that this might happen. I thought up to the last second that um, we could save it. 
Watts says the program would have required a $49 million infusion during the next five years. Nobody has come forward with a firm commitment of any additional resources. And we've asked, and if the checks were in the bank, it would be one thing. We cannot lead this university on promises. But critics say Watts didn't consult with the school's biggest supporters. Can you imagine making a decision to kill a program, yet you don't talk to your top donors, you don't talk to former players, you don't talk to the alumni, you don't talk to the city? How much data was really went into this decision? In my particular case, and I went and asked, and uh, I was never given the opportunity to say I would contribute or not contribute. Would you have? I sure would have. Since the announcement, Watts has been the subject of artistic expression and protest rallies. If Dr. Watts were sitting where I'm sitting, what would you guys say to him? Stand up, do what's right, you know what's right. Fix this. For UAB coaches and players, all that remains is the slim hope of a bowl invitation. Deep ball has a man. Touchdown! In my heart, I still think we can fix this program, and maybe that bowl game can help. Mm -hmm. Maybe everybody in the world seeing UAB play one more time. Give us a chance. Will give us another chance. Just one more time being able to play, that would be my Christmas. One, two, three, three. Supporters said they went to Ray Watts and had certified checks, certified pledges for $5 million, and they said they could raise more if they would get a commitment that the program would remain in place. They said that they did not get that commitment. And Chris, while we were there filming those interviews, coaches from around the country were flying into Birmingham. One coach told me it was a coaches' convention at the Birmingham airport. They were camped out outside academic buildings waiting for those players to recruit them. Even in the football facility parking lot, it was a surreal scene. Well, Joe, thank you. That is a, a footnote. Doesn't take long for coaches to try to go spot talent. Yeah. At least the players will have an opportunity to play football, go somewhere else. But boy, without knowing every detail of that story, and it's a complicated one, you feel for those guys who are screaming and yelling and crying. Yes. Standing UAB here, by the way. Here. It's, it's an example of, of politics really just destroying collegiate sports, the behind the, 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 the door dealings of collegiate sports. And those young men, they suffer because of it. That should never happen in a program like that, never. I think it just, it, it's a great example for fans at home to get caught up in the who should be in the Final Four about what college football is really about. To see the emotion, the passion from these players standing up, talking to their president about what this program means to them, what playing football means to them, representing their school means to them. That was a great testimony to me yeah. of what really college football is all about. And it's a business that's in, the money. Yeah. It's in. But I tell you what, something behind the scenes is working there. Yeah. Mark my words, it'll come out sooner or later. All right, well, you said it in different ways, what college football is all about. Some positive yeah, things, some negative things as well. But yeah. you know, in the spirit of contributions that will not be made, and respect for that story, I will not contribute $100 to the w guy who gets this question right, if anybody does. But you know how rare <laughs> that is to cancel an FBS or Division 1A program? You know the last program that, that canceled football? Xavier. Nope, that's not what I'm looking for. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no. Who, do you know what uh, Pete Carroll's alma mater is? Pacific. Pacific. Pacific, Pacific yeah. Oh, California. That was uh, the last program. It was not FBS. It was Division One A at the time to cancel football. That's how rare it is to do what was done at UAB. Wow. I thought it was Xavier because when I was in Indiana, I went and got myself a defensive tackle from Xavier. From Xavier. Yeah, that's Did me. You really? I was so if you're still guys. coaching, you'd be flying right into Birmingham. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Get <laughs> corners in here. Get a corner. No. You, 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 you check what Vulture. you need. And you, you check what you need. And you say, <laughs> hey, Vulture? I got yeah. that guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we, we wish the best for the players in that position yeah. if they want to continue their careers and if they don't, uh, yeah. wishing the best at the rest of their career at UAB. A tough story. You didn't think you'd hear fans in Waco, Texas chanting UAB on a, yeah. on a Saturday morning. They will not be chanting TCU, that's for sure. Kickoff coming up on ABC. We'll get to that game in a second. Kickoff tonight in Indianapolis. Cardell Jones and the Buckeyes. What does this inexperienced but talented quarterback have to do to get the win and perhaps convince the committee? What does Gary Patterson Ooh. Ooh. I'll, I'll, I'll get the head start. Here we go. 
<laughs> the committee has a number three. They know nothing less than a huge win against Iowa State will do. What does Baylor have to do? Is there room for both or none in the bracket? And they come back. The Cheese It Real Fan of the Week is brought to you by Cheese It. Because at Cheese It, real cheese matters. Here's the Cheese It Real Fan Cam back in Waco, Texas. And our Cheese It Real Fan of the Week is Sean Adair, known as Smokey from Conroe, Texas. Named his dog Heisman the year RG3 won the Heisman Trophy. By this, uh, he drives a Baylor green Camaro, Des. Smokey. And been to every home game for the last five years. Is that, is that an unsanctioned mascot? Is he just doing his thing there? Yeah, I, I guess. Just by Smokey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Smokey. 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 The unmasked Smokey. The College Football Home Depot Award Show Thursday, 7 o'clock Eastern Time. Melvin Gordon, of course, a favorite, you have to say, for the Doak Walker Award, which will be rolled out. Yeah. Yeah. Would he be a Maxwell Award finalist? Heisman Trophy finalist as well. He'll be on display in Indy tonight for Ohio State. Meanwhile, the question, can Cardell Jones lead an Ohio State offense to do what Braxton Miller, what Carlos Hyde, what Corey Brown, what an offensive line that currently has three rookie NFL starters could not do a year ago, which is score enough points to win a Big Ten championship against a very stout defense in a pressure situation. We talked earlier, Jalen Marshall, Zeke Elliott, they got to make big plays to take the bo uh, burden off of that young quarterback. Vegas aside, Ohio State will not feel like underdogs against Wisconsin. They beat them three in a row, but all by seven points or less, and six of the last seven. Melvin Gordon, already the Big Ten single-season record holder for yards. He's fresh. He told me he's driven to make it a special punctuation to a special season. Gary Anderson, very aware of the challenge, regardless of who plays quarterback for Ohio State. They are very talented. There's speed all over the field. They are a matchup offense. They will try to create mismatches. It's not really how we think we match up. It's making sure that we do our best to get ourselves in the best matchup. So that's going to be a big part of the football game. Cardell Jones, and it's up to him for Ohio State. Jones turns it upfield. He's a big kid, number one. He's very athletic for how big he is. I've seen him hurdle people uh, that big, and we can't get in a position to take poor angles or, quite frankly, just flatten his tackles because he's such a big kid running the ball. Wisconsin's defense has not always faced the toughest competition. Let's keep it real. But look at how they rank in the FBS in these categories. They have more three and outs than any defense out there. They really do a tremendous job of limiting plays of 10-plus yards. Ohio State has been excellent with explosive plays. At least when Barrett ran the show, Wisconsin's defense certainly has been strong in that department. Meanwhile, the Buckeyes arrive after a very trying week on several fronts. Today, they will remember former teammate Costas Kara George with a number 53 sticker on their helmets. Kara George found Sunday, a day after he was supposedly going to suit up for his final home game against Michigan, dead from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. So for a team getting ready for a big game, it's a motivational challenge, certainly as they deal with the grief. Back to Quint Kesnick is with Urban Meyer. Coach, how has your team responded to the emotional wave that comes with losing a teammate in Costa Cara, George? Oh, it's horrible. Uh, but I, I've made this comment before. This is a very close team. And I, I watch, I, I learn more from our players than I'll ever learn from our coaches. You know, players are so, uh, especially this team is so close. And the, to see the way they react, uh, they love the player we lost, Costa. And uh, uh, we played tribute to him on Wednesday with to see the family and, and uh, it, it was just a, a tough situation, but tough situations sometimes even means close, cl brings teams even closer. What have you seen this week specifically in practice from Cardell Jones that indicates that he's ready to, to play a, a winning game? Uh, execution of practice. He had a very good Wednesday. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, we call them bloody Tuesdays because we give him bad looks and make it very difficult. But the best thing I see about Cardell Jones is what's around him. You know, he's got an offensive line that, uh, you know, I don't think we're in the best in the conference yet, but we're on our way. Uh, much improved. He's got that stands right next to a thousand yard rusher in the backfield. Uh, two very good tight ends that I think both will play in the NFL. And then you got a group of receivers that are much, much improved. So uh, uh, quarterbacks always, always a product of those around them. Thanks, Coach. Uh, Chris, back to you.
Quinn, thank you. So lots of subplots in that game and a very different motivational backdrop. Before the Michigan game, you know, it was Urban Meyer playing LL Cool J. It's time for war. war exactly. On a continuous loop. Always shine brighter when I'm under attack. Might be down for a moment, but I always come back. That's interesting impressive. choice of yeah, <laughs> interesting choice of, of songs there from LL Cool J. But yeah. boy, it couldn't be a different <laughs> you know, yeah. backdrop for this game than last week. Yeah, and now they find themselves in an underdog role with, a, with the loss of JT Barrett for this game. It's been talked about all week with Cordell Jones. One thing to remember about this matchup is Wisconsin's defense has been outstanding, and they play a ton of man-to-man -man coverage, and they crowd the line of scrimmage, which could play into the hands of Ohio State offense. There's the Home Depot coach's playbook. Remember the Michigan State game for Ohio State? Michael Thomas, there's the man-to-man -man look. Gets separation, which would be big today for Cordell Jones, making easy reads. Reads. If his receivers can beat man-to-man, -man, they've got to win on the outside. Thomas 3 is a guy to keep an eye on. Also, Devin Smith. They move him around from the outside into the inside if they can find a matchup to their liking here against a safety. Again, the straight speed. One of the fastest players on their team. Cordell Jones loves to throw the deep ball. And here's the wrinkle. You'll see number 17, Jalen Marshall, the H-back, former high school quarterback out of Middletown, was recruited to play receiver. But he comes in to run the Wildcat. He's done it all year, even with JT Barrett. Now with Cordell Jones at 6'5", 250. They lose that elusiveness from that position. So you'll see that wrinkle. So I think Cordell Jones will play very, very well. I think they'll keep it simple for him. I think a lot of downfield passing. And then they'll mix in Jalen Marshall. And I don't know about you, but when you put Urban Meyer yeah. in an underdog role with a lot at stake, yeah. Chances are he's going to find a way to get it done. I like Ohio State <laughs> to win a tough club. boy. Wisconsin has a nationally ranked defense, mm -hmm. but watch that offense led by Jalen Marshall. He's an athlete. He can run, he can throw, he can catch, and he's a punt returner. I think, Desmond, he's the difference in this game. Yeah. He will win the game for, Mich for uh, Ohio State, Ohio State yeah, over right. Wisconsin. He may be the expert. Marshall is the game. Yep. I agree with you. I agree. You know, you look at Wisconsin's offensive line, I don't know if they can really affect. Uh, Ohio State's defensive line with zone blocking. I think they're going to have to go to gap blocks. I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. When you go zone blocking scheme, you need to get the double team up front on the nose tackles and then work your way up to the linebacker right there. Since they couldn't get up to the linebacker, watch how he hits Melvin Gordon. That's Ohio State's defense. I think Wisconsin's offense is going to have to go down blocks and then pull a guard or an H-back like they're going to do right here. You're going to see 54. He's going to pull around. He's going to get a linebacker and then watch the left tackle number 61 one right there. Both guys are getting to the next level, and this springs Melvin Gordon for a big run. When you look at Ohio State's front four, the interior guys, Washington, Bennett, like we spoke of before, that's the beef of their defensive line. You're going to have to get beyond them to the next level if Gordon's going to have a big game yeah. tonight. They do a good job at, at taking angles and limiting this giant running plays. No, no, Melvin, no. if memory really serves, do. has nine runs of 50-plus yards. Man. Nine. He's been the home run threat. I love the way he instinctively eludes those guys, gives them bad angles yes. in the secondary. That's a big thing. He's going to break through the line of scrimmage sometime. Yeah, exactly. What will they do with him? All this talk about Cordell Jones, what Dez is touching on is a bigger question mark than how Cordell Jones in the Ohio State offense yes. will play. How do they defend this running game <laughs> with the, the illustrations and the pictures that you just showed? Because that's been their concern all year, even the last couple of weeks, is that gap, being gap sound and being able to get those linebackers and safeties up and to be able to stop a great back. If I was right. a Ohio State coach, I'd get those guys in a room and I'd say, You're gonna, Wisconsin's going to test your manhood. Yeah. Right. You're exactly. going to do it? Yep. Let's yep. go. Yep. They'll occasionally throw the football, too. they got a couple tight ends. Yep. Receivers, stavi has been good on third down, yep. so they've been moving the chains better. But can he elude that pass rush? Can yeah, that offensive right. line not just open holes, but yes. better block Joey Bosa coming off the edge there? Yeah, exactly, Lots of stuff yeah. to look at in that game tonight. Can Ohio State pull a mild upset and make a claim at the Final Four? Well, much more coming up. We talked about Jameis Winston earlier. No Power 5 quarterback. More picks before halftime. George Whitfield dissects what's behind Jameis' struggles and if he can correct those tonight against Georgia Tech. And Mr. Corso has never gone with the Baylor headgear yet. Yet is a big word today. Will today be the day or it's going to be Willie the Wildcat? <laughs> College game day built by the Home Depot is brought to you by Coke Zero. Show us how you count down to game day with hashtag countdown to zero. Cheese it grooves because a cheese it Real cheese matters. And Heineken. Open your world. Enjoy responsibly.
countdown to kickoff is brought to you by Coke Zero. Show us how you count down to game day with hashtag countdown to zero. Folks up in section zero as the sun has come out here in Waco. Beautiful weather expected tonight and seasonably warm for Big 12. Rainy in Charlotte, where we'll be tonight, primetime on ABC, Florida State and Georgia Tech for the ACC championship game. Showers off and on today. Chances lessening after halftime as Georgia Tech tries to pull the mild upset, get to 11 wins. Both teams coming off emotional victories in rivalry games. Both coaches say still plenty of energy. The teams are charged up. For Jameis Winston, his week included the long-delayed hearing in front of a retired judge presiding over the student code of conduct matter of accusations of rape in December of 2012. Hearing about ten and a half hours over Tuesday and Wednesday, Winston read a statement on his account of the events that night, would not answer questions. His accuser appeared separately. A timetable is somewhat defined now, with briefs due from both sides by next Friday, which is the final day of the semester. And then after that, a ruling from Major Harding, possible but not guaranteed by December 22nd, which must be then approved by Florida State's president. Either side may appeal, which would push the resolution well into January. Winston did not miss practice either day because it was moved to nights. He comes off his first four interception game. He's thrown 12 picks in his last six games, facing Georgia Tech for the first time in his career. The Jackets have a whopping 17 picks. They've taken five back to the house. They have thrived on takeaways during their current five-game winning streak. Jimbo Fisher knows you played Georgia Tech. It requires discipline and perhaps a little patience as well. Coach, you face a Georgia Tech team that many say has an offense that's very hard to prepare for. So how do you, in one week, prepare for that triple option? Well, I think playing Citadel early gave us a, a little blueprint for at least having the kids identify with the kind of schemes we're going to use. But then at the end of the day, you've got to stop all three phases, the dive, the pitch, and then, you know, the quarterback and then the pitch. But it's going to be discipline, it's going to be eye control, and then being very physical at the points of attack. This week, your quarterback, Jameis Winston, has split time between a student code of conduct hearing and preparing for an ACC championship game. In your mind, how has that affected mindset and preparation? Actually, I, I don't think he has. He can compartmentalize, and he's had one of the best weeks of practice he's had all year, maybe in the last two years, and our team in general has. I think, uh, I don't know, it's like it, it's, uh, they've uh, gotten, the team has gotten through the season, but Jameis handles these things very well, and he's practiced extremely well this week. Coach, thanks so much. Thank you. Back to you. <laughs> Oh, those computers, those computers, <laughs> not really fans of Florida State. If you did the committee, Dud Love, the undefeated, defending national champions of the 25-game winning streak, look at the computers. Oh, Kenneth Massey, remember him? <laughs> he used to weigh in in the BCS era. BCS era. Sagarin, 17th? Wow. Wow. Kidding me? Oh, Massey, we haven't heard from him in a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight's quarterback matchup in Charlotte, the rematch of the 05 Pot Warner Championship. Look at old Jameis there. Like, like, a foot taller than the other kids. This is 2005, 11-year-old <laughs> sixth graders. Jameis, three touchdowns for his team. But Justin Thomas, Justin Thomas, the quarterback for the Jackets. For the Nolan, Look at the scoop and score, the yeah. speed for the young man. Man, That's thank sweet. Coach Greg Blackman for that video. Jameis's team, by the way, did win 22-6 Hoover over Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Thomas... Who comes out of Alabama recruited by the Tide and the Auburn Tigers as a DB at Florida State. One of them is an athlete, but he's developed into Paul Johnson's most complete quarterback ever. 16 touchdowns, four picks. Second leading rusher, Zach Lasky, the senior B-back. Dependable, healthy again after a shoulder injury cost him three and a half games. It's hard to trap behind the line of scrimmage. He's a leader for this team, and so is Sinjin Davis, who filled in really well. Tech's offense, number one in the ACC in rushing yards, of course, but also points, yards, and fewest three and outs. Can they reverse the result from two years ago in Charlotte? Well, you know, this is the big one. It's the ACC championship, something that we've had on our goal board since early this year. They did beat us in the 2012 ACC championship game, and it would be apropos if we could pay them back here in 2014. I still remember that game very clearly. Uh, they, were, they were a very physical football team. We have an opportunity to go in there and hopefully not pour State out of the playoff race. Their winning streak started against us two years ago, and it'll be a bit of a coincidence to them with us, but we've just got to go out there and play ball, and we can't be thinking about ending a streak. We've just got to think about winning the game. 
When Tech throws it, they're efficient. So a blow tonight not to have their top receiver, DeAndre Smelter, who's out for Florida State. Carlos Williams out with a concussion. And Terrence Smith, the guy who made that game-changing pick six against the Gators, he's also unlikely to contribute much. So Matthew Thomas, the freshman, steps in. Chris, as you know, getting ready for this game, Charles Kelly, who's the current Florida State defensive coordinator, spent a lot of time on the Georgia Tech staff as a defensive coordinator. In fact, the last time these two teams played in the ACC championship game, he was on the other side. So he knows about this offense and how to try to prepare for it. Here is the simple triple option, midline, re making a quick read on the inside veer here. If the defensive tackle stays wide, you give it to the fullback. This is different than zone read because the quarterback's under center. Here's the same look. Now you see the linebackers and his read, 71, commit down to the fullback. That will take him to his next read, and he pitches it out, gets it to the back, who can get to the corner and get into the end zone. And this is the part that they're going to have to capitalize on right here. Same look, affect the eyes of that Florida State defense. The linebackers in the secondary, give them that same look and then throw the ball downfield behind the coverage. So you, you just heard uh, Jimbo Fisher talk about how it's going to really challenge our eyes and our discipline. We've got to play assignment football. It's great to talk about that. It's hard to prepare for that. And then the speed and the execution in which Georgia Tech runs this offense, it's easy to rely back on your instincts and not go with what Charles Kelly has told you for the last five days. So, Des, that will be a big, big challenge for Florida State. The best way to stop this is a defensive line with Eddie Goldman and Mario Edwards and company dominate the line of scrimmage and take that option game out. Yeah, and get Ramsey involved, too. I think yeah. he's going to be key for Florida State's yeah. defense. How about Georgia Tech's defense, too? I think Georgia Tech's defense is going to be challenged by Jameis Winston. They haven't faced a quarterback with his talent level. And then when you look at the receivers that he has, Rashad Green, and now he's getting his, his tight end involved, too. I think that Jameis Winston, they're going to have to come out fast. You cannot come out slow and turn the ball over against Georgia Tech because, like I said earlier, they're third in the nation time of possession they like to hold the pill 34 minutes per game is the average so they're gonna have to come out fast spread the ball around but I, I expect that Rashad Green is gonna have a big game because I don't think that Georgia Tech's secondary can match Florida State's wideouts well Des Tech has won five games in a row using the flexible and they've averaged 40 points a game wow they run they run and then what I think is the problem whoosh, they go over the top of Florida State's defense. Florida State will win this game somehow, yeah. some way, <laughs> by one point. Yeah. One point. One, one point. point. And lucky to be closer. Yeah. Closer. You saw him going over their head, but Smelter yeah. is a huge loss. I mean, yeah. he averaged yeah. 20 yards per reception. That's a big loss. Big receiver, too. 6'3". Yeah, sure. yeah. You know, the Knowles, it was, it was crucial with their chances to beat the Gators for the Jackets to beat Georgia. That was enormous. Great scene with the oh, fans man. in Atlanta welcoming yeah. the buses who came from Athens yeah. back down there. They still got plenty of energy left, they say, to yeah. perhaps knock off for Florida State. Paul Johnson, by the way, just this morning they made it official, rewarding him with a new four-year contract extension Good going job. for the 2020 season. Awesome. Every couple of years they say, let's get rid of that flex bone. That's, that's outdated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Then he comes yeah. back and they win the division <laughs> again. And they, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it going. Keep it quarterback going. guru George Winston checks in now because right from the very first snap for Florida State, George, the eyes are going to be on Jameis Winston and his first half struggles. What have you seen that he can correct tonight to get off to a faster start against the Yellow Jackets? Well, Chris, let's be honest. He is not as good as he was last year. And two big reasons for that. Lack of detail in the first half. Lack of detail and then he's been a big gambler with the football. Those two things don't coincide with victories usually. But they and they have certainly put him in some some spots, some holes that he's had to dig Florida State out of. He's driving a different ship this year, and he has a different crew. They need him to protect them and mitigate loss as much as they need him to make plays. He's got to iron that out. Yeah, we always ask, you know, what's in Winston's head facing what he faces off the field. The hearing this week, they never reveal much. Fisher saying he looked very good in practice. We'll see if that carries over to the game. George, another guy you work with is Baylor's Bryce Petty, as this crowd wakes up and cheers here. We talked to Bryce the other day. He's a 23-year-old graduate student, a very mature guy, a tough guy who's played this year through a couple of fractured vertebrae. He comes off a concussion. How quickly are they looking to get the ball out of his hands and, and take us through how you work with him on those perimeter throws? Well, he's fine with the concussion. A big staple in Baylor's offense. Because they have a big-arm quarterback and all that speed out there on the edge, 
is getting the ball straight to the boundary. We call this drill in preparation for that pull and go. It's the quarterback's ability to basically turn two like a middle infielder in baseball. How fast can you get up, produce the ball, and get it to the edge? The faster you can do that, and you see here by the clock on the, on the animation, if you can get that, you give your guys a chance. You eliminate the defenders in the box from getting a chance to make their way over in pursuit, and your receiver has a chance to make a one-on-one -on -one play and get north. Baylor does that. That's Mo Coach Montgomery and Coach Bryles' system. That's a staple. That's why they've had so much success. That's why they'll have a big win tonight. Oh, a prediction from George. All right. <laughs> oh, three, man. three big passes over the Cats last year. So you know K-State's going to sit back, prevent the big play. They're not a great pass rush team, typically. We'll see if they can get in Petty's head. You talk about, uh, you, you talk about a guy who came here. You saw this the other night. They were happy to get into the Texas Bowl to beat or take on Illinois. They lost the game. That's where he's come in his career. Now they're trying to win a conference title for the second consecutive year and perhaps get in the playoff. What a, what a job. Art Bryles and RG3. Absolutely. Thank him. Thank him. Yeah. Thank him. Yeah. Now we'll talk about the crazy things that happen sometimes on Championship Saturday. What upsets might lie in store later this afternoon and tonight. Predictions, of course, are ahead. Crimson Tide trying to dodge the Tigers upset trap in Atlanta. And we will visit with Nick Saban coming up. More from Waco as we build toward the prediction segment of the show. Nick George gave a pick. <laughs> This is the first time for Game Band Waco, but yeah. I think they may have seen the show and they've become aware that signs. Signs. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, yeah, there, there's really a lot of potential targets for the signs, a lot of them. <laughs> Minnesota reference to TCU's non conference win. Yeah. Never forget. Oh, the oh, cat. Katie with the cat. <laughs> Yeah. It's just shut its way. Former yeah. rivals in yeah. the field. Ancestry.com oh, as a dating website. <laughs> 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 you take offense to that. Yeah. The, the AARP <laughs> Bill Snyder is being yes. targeted. Now, he knows Victoria's <laughs> Secret. Yeah. yeah. He'll know. Jeff Thomas comes with a shirt on. That's a shot of the committee chairman for uh, now. That's of the week. The high yeah. test. Oh, that's oh. a great win. <laughs> this thing, they've studied history here. That was a good one. Yeah. It's a, hey, man. You got there in the top four. You like Fuller if you did. Oh, no. Ooh, ouch. Wow. Ouch. ouch. Wow. It's personal. <laughs> it, that, that's that's personal. Personal. Right. Personal, boy. That's, that's what nice. this thing creates. Yeah. <laughs> well, meanwhile, in Atlanta. Oh, man. We're happy to be in Waco than Atlanta today, aren't we? I think so. You got a great scene. Rainy. Great crowd. Inside the Maybe. dome, of course. Pep preparations will begin. It's the original. Let's be honest. It's still the best conference championship yeah. game. There has been a occasional history of, of surprises there. If you remember last year, it's easy to forget now, but Missouri was actually a favorite over Auburn before the Tigers dropped the hammer on them and, and won going away in the second half. Missouri is not a real emotional team. They don't get stirred up by being an underdog. Hey, you write us off, we'll show you. <laughs> yeah, show you. That's just, that works for a lot of teams. That's not really the personality of the Tigers. They've been flat at times when you expect them to win, so don't expect the big circle of the wagons. But do remember this, nine times the last couple of years, Missouri has been an underdog. Eight times they have won the game. Just file that away. That's it. Mm. Mm. And the DirecTV Mobile Studio brings us inside the drive with Nick Saban, who joins us now from Atlanta. Nick, potentially one more win before the playoff would begin. You've talked about a playoff atmosphere for your team ever since the loss to Ole Miss. What has that brought out of the Crimson Tide so far? Well, I think our team is showing great resiliency this year to be able to make the plays when they needed to and overcome a lot of adversity. And, you know, this is a great venue here today, playing in the SEC championship game for, for our team. You know, we've earned our way here. Missouri's earned their way here. Two really good teams, so uh, it should be a great game. Missouri has earned its way. It may not have a typical SEC division champions resume. SEC fans still getting used to the idea of seeing the Tigers in Atlanta. What's the level of respect for their team from your guys? Well, we have a tremendous amount of respect for their team. You know, their defensive team has been 
phenomenal and probably playing as good a defense as anybody in our league, you know, especially in the second half of the season. Uh, their front guys give you a lot of problems, a lot of negative plays, uh, really good pressure on the passer. Uh, that allows them to do a lot of rolling up and playing different coverages in the secondary. They do a good job of disguising that. And offensively, you know, in the last three or four ball games, they've been very, very productive. You know, Matty Mock has played well for them. And, you know, they have great balance on offense, which makes it, you know, difficult to defend. I know that what ifs are not in your wheelhouse the day of the game, but there's been a lot of talk about this. In your view, sitting there now, does Alabama have to win this game today to be considered a, a playoff team? Well, I, I don't look at it like that in terms of the playoff. You know, this this is a, a huge thing for our team and our players and our program and the University of Alabama. Uh, you know, we still feel like winning the SEC is, you know, a real accomplishment um, for any team. Uh, and it's certainly something that, you know, our players, you know, visualize through the course of the year that, you know, they want to win their division and they want to have a chance to play in the SEC championship game. and. I think that's really what we're focused on right now, and I think it would be really important to us if we can play our best game today so we give ourselves a chance to do that. All right, Nick, we appreciate it. Thanks for your time today. All right, thanks, Chris. David, I, I took a swing with that question there. What if Alabama loses? I, did, I didn't expect much of an answer. Let's talk about this Crimson Tide offense. All of us with the last name... Fowler could not be more <laughs> proud of Alabama's fullback in the way he's played this season. Yeah, there's a lot of big names with Blake Sims and Amari Cooper and TJ Yeldon, and, and you talk about that all the time, but how about giving love to the fullback? The big man does a great job blocking. I mean, you see him come downhill and hit the safety, get some of that. I mean, he's a 250-pound fullback, really does a great job physical at the point of attack. Look at him also slip out in the back. So you block on the inside on the safety. You get on the outside, you can block on the perimeter. He's a very versatile piece that they like to use. And then how about this? He's hammered you, hammered you, hammered you. They sneak him out of the backfield, throw him a bone, throw him a pass. He runs the football. He catches the football in the backfield. But most importantly, he's one of the best blockers and one of the best fullbacks in college football. Hey, David, it, this, uh, this Alabama offense has been one of the great stories this year in college football with the way they have spread teams out. Blake Sims has become one of the great individual stories along with Lane Kiffin as an offensive coordinator. But this might be their biggest challenge that they have faced all year because of this front four. Shane Ray up front uses his hands. Incredible quickness off the edge in that dome. Keep an eye on 56. Marcus Golden on the other side. Bookends. Relentless approach to his position. Healthy now and putting a lot of pressure on quarterbacks. Alabama will probably look to get the ball out of the hands quickly. And when you have that kind of front, it allows the back seven to play a lot of zone and they read the quarterback's eyes they're not in man-to-man -man with their backs turned away from the quarterback here does a good job of feeling it baiting the quarterback and then stepping in front of it and coming up with a big interception they, they do it, such a phenomenal job of creating havoc with just four. It's one of the few teams in the country that can do that. So Lane Kiffin and Blake Sims will have to come up with a plan where they rely on the running game and also an ability to get Amari Cooper downfield, vertical seams behind those safeties because that front four is legit. And that offensive line better be ready to go because these boys can play. Yeah, if I'm Missouri's quarterback, Matty Muff, though, I, I'm really excited because did you see Bama's secondary in the Iron Bowl? If I'm him, I'm looking up Eddie Jackson. Let me show you number four right there. If you're going to get on the nose of a wideout, you got to get your hands on him. So he missed the jam. Now he's running with him. That's okay. He looks up, locates the ball, but he's not athletic enough to make a competitive play on the pass. So another chunk play for Auburn. Now look at him right. This is quarters coverage meaning he doesn't have any responsibilities underneath, and he's not going to have safety help over the top. So it's almost like a man-to-man -man situation. Now he's shuffling back. He gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar. He's peeking in the backfield. He doesn't use the sideline as an extra defender, so he gives up another touchdown. Poor technique by Eddie Jackson. If I'm Maddie Monk, I'm looking up number four all day today. Uncharacteristic of Alabama's defense. They gave up eight plays of 20 yards or greater in the Iron Bowl. I would have to be excited if I'm that Matty Mark. That was take. a tough tape study. I wonder if that was tougher than what Saban oh, played in Jack Hancock. Stop that kid. Yeah, yeah. Is he still on scholarship? He a, yeah, he had a rough week. Yeah, he's pretty <laughs> tough. Typical receiver. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, when Missouri moved from the Big 12 to the SEC, everybody said, uh-oh, yeah. there's a big problem. Mm -hmm. 
They were wrong. Missouri's been to back-to-back -back SEC title games, and they've won 12 of the last 14 SEC games. This is going to be a tough game for Alabama. Alabama wins by a field goal, but very, very tough. But you guys win. I'm with you. Alabama very close wins. game, huh? Yes, I, very I, close I, game. I think so, too. Yeah. I think for three quarters, and then I think Alabama <laughs> will pull away. But oh. I, I don't think Alabama respects Missouri. I think they're going to be flat, and I think Missouri's plan. The experience last year yes. against Auburn will help them to know what to anticipate in this game. I think they're going to play very well. I just think Bama will pull See, away. I disagree. I think Alabama's going to be excited. After that film study, I mean, <laughs> that's a reason for Nick Saban yeah. and Kirby Smart to go in there and beat up his defense. Like, you sure. guys got to play different. So I think they're going to play very well. I think there's going to be a close game for maybe a quarter and a half, but I think Alabama runs away with that game. Experts say it's the lowest scoring big game, second lowest scoring game, period. Nobody's really expecting a shootout. I think they're expecting yeah. Missouri defense to show up and keep him in the game, but where is the Tigers going to get the points? Yeah, and Marcus Murphy breaking Murphy. it, making a play, yeah. maybe a be special tough. teams play. Yeah, yeah. be tough. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, this game here tonight on opposing sidelines, two men that share a very strong bond going back to a, a very sad day in Manhattan, Kansas, Tom. Chris, still ahead on college game day when we return here to Waco as these two teams face each other for a conference title. Two teams and two coaches share a much deeper connection. Baylor's Phil Bennett and K-State's Bill Snyder going back 15 seasons ago to a terrible moment when one coach needed another. My life had come to an end. He motivated me to do things I didn't know if I was capable of doing. Some say McLean City represents a high-tech World Cup soccer-type venue. And they mean that as a compliment. It'll be rocking tonight. On Championship Saturday, this game will be primetime on ESPN, 745. you got to have a flicker handy or a few television sets on Championship Saturday to eyeball all these games with playoff impact. One of the subplots in two different games is a protege coaching a defense, Tom, against his mentor. One of them will be in Charlotte, where it's Charles Kelly coaching Florida State against Paul Johnson's offense. And one of them is here, is Phil Bennett coaches the Bears defense against Bill Snyder and K-State's offense. I'm not sure mentor-protege begins to describe a relationship between those two men, though. I think in this case and in this game, Chris, it goes much deeper. Phil Bennett is, is in his 36th season as a coach in college football, his fourth year at Baylor. But if you go back 15 years ago, it was his first season with Kansas State. It was a place his wife, Nancy, was looking to call home, a place she called a great adventure. But 15 seasons ago, Phil Bennett's family and his life changed forever in a place that still remains in Bennett's heart. Let's go, let's go. Practice with the purpose. Lot on the line. I want to come up and I want to reroute him which direction. You got to take off and cover that. Got that? All right, come back. It's easy to hear him. Let's go, let's go. And to see him. But to understand why Phil Bennett is still coaching, the answer isn't only here at Baylor. The answer begins at Kansas State with one terrible moment and two strong coaches. He saved my life, and I don't say that just lightly. When he talks to his team about family at Kansas State, one thing I can tell you, they mean it. We were often close friends, and I didn't do anything Phil wouldn't have done for me. Phil Bennett's life was full when he arrived in Manhattan, Kansas, 15 years ago. Married with two young children, he and his wife Nancy had already been at six schools before Bennett took the defensive coordinator job for Bill Snyder. It was such a true family atmosphere. When Nancy got up there, she knew it. She could tell by the way that I was responding, and, and we enjoyed that. August 11th, 1999. On a cloudy morning, Nancy went on a four-mile run. When she didn't return, Phil went to look for her. I saw a police vehicle. 
I said, have you seen a good looking blonde jogging? And his head snapped and, and uh, turned and looked at me. And I just knew, yeah, I, I said, what happened? In the only recorded lightning strike that day, Nancy was hit in the back of the head. She was rushed into emergency care. I remember going into the hospital and seeing my mom and being confused why she had, you know, black eyes and um, bruises on her arms and just, it wasn't my mom. Didn't look anything like her. Her shoes had melted, the bottom of her shoes. And, um, and I knew, I knew it was bad. And uh, just uh, from that point on, it became a, a long odyssey. During that time, Bill Snyder was at the hospital every single night. He's going through two a days, and he's up there. As soon as practice is over, he's up there with me until 2 o'clock, and then coming back and practicing the next morning. I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody that would do that. After 17 days, most on life support, the odyssey ended. 41 years old, Nancy left behind Phil, 11-year-old Sam, and 8-year-old Maddie. I remember him waking me up and waking Sam up, and he sat us on the couch and told us that she was gone, and it was kind of like a shock, like I still didn't believe it. I just remember when I, when I told him, I said, Mom, Mom died. They just both came and tackled me. So that was stuck with me. With the season opener a week away, Bennett offered his resignation to his head coach. I said, I need to go back to Texas and try to raise these kids where I got some people who will help me. And uh, he said, no, you don't. You got people here that will help you. We talked about, you're not going to be happy out of football. I mean, I know Phil too well. And what impact is that going to have on the children? Coach Snyder gave him hope. He made the, the role of being a mom and a dad and a football coach possible. Didn't give up on him. Didn't let him quit. That's it. Good, good. That's it. I come back. That 1999 season, Bennett's defense was second in the nation as Kansas State finished 11-1, led by one coach who wanted to quit and another who wouldn't let him. As I knew it, my life had come to an end. He motivated me to do things I didn't know if I was capable of doing. He needed a helping hand and he needed love, and that's what the Kansas State family provided him. A strong man and a special family, Phil remarried in 2005 to Julie White, who was a friend of Nancy's. It's for the job he's done as a father. You saw Maddie in that piece. She graduates in December from Baylor and will become a nurse in Dallas. As for his son Sam, he's followed him into the coaching profession. He's a GA at Rice. Chris, you and I had the opportunity to speak both to Coach Snyder and to Coach Bennett yesterday during their respective walkthroughs. The emotional connection is strong, but so is the competitive streak, each in his own way, relishing the opportunity to look across the other, across that sideline, and know there's a lot at stake in this football game today, and neither would have it any other way. They love each other, but believe me, today, it's about competing and winning. Tom Matt has perfectly said, and, and Bill Snyder, in typical Snyder fashion, downplaying the role that he played in Bennett's life. But he has complete belief that Bennett's defense of Baylor will be as ready as it can be to take on Kansas State's offense. Snyder's offense presents problems, perhaps the best passing attack he's had in a long time. Jake Waters has played through a, a shoulder injury through most of the year. He's got 11 uh, 200 yard games. He had a 400 yard game earlier. Curry, Sexton, and Tyler Lockett are dangerous targets. Lockett, in particular, Big 12 coaches will tell you, is the number one matchup issue in this entire conference. One more touchdown. He breaks his dad's Kevin's career touchdown reception record. Already broke his other records in recent weeks. For Baylor, Petty will look for Corey Coleman. It's become about 
Coleman, when you look at the receiving threats here, Shock Linwood is the fifth consecutive 1,000-yard rusher. And as we said earlier, Bryce Petty becoming one of those rare quarterbacks to pass his concussion test the week after getting hit in the head. It'll be important to see what he can do. Petty could not be more motivated for this game. He's huge on their offense. And you watch him every week. He's always competing. He cares so much about their team. And uh, he's, he's a great leader for them. He makes good decisions. I think he manages the offense extremely well. He can throw the ball downfield, but he can throw all those short passes quite well. And if you uh, try to put too many people in areas to defend the pass, then he can run the ball as well. Every time you, you see somebody get tackled, there's, there's five or six guys around the ball. So they hustle each and every play. And, and those are guys with high motors that are hard to play against because we like the tempo. That's what is, is advantageous for us. I'm getting guys tired. And so it's, it's almost like they don't get tired. They don't ever give up or ever roll over. And so we know we have to come ready to go, focus the whole game, and you know minimize our mistakes because we know they're not going to make very many. Can't be easy playing quarterback when you know the other side can <laughs> possess the ball for six or seven minutes. All of a sudden, it's like third and four coach and you, you better make that pass oh. you might not see the ball for a while let me, let me tell you some key points why Baylor has been such a great success in the two, Big 12 they can throw the football like the best of them Petty has TD pass in the last 23 straight games and they can run it Linwood scored 15 touchdowns this season he's a great runner and they can catch it Coleman leads the Big 12 in receiving. They got a great offense. They do it all, and they're ready to win this game. Now, remember one thing about that. I can't emphasize enough, David. They are extremely tough in that place. Yeah. Yeah. They win more games and do more things in that place than anybody else. They're going to be tough to beat this week. And, and they usually score, score over 40 yes. in this place. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I tell you what, it, it's frustrating as a defensive guy when you watch Baylor's offense because they put you in a tough position. What do you do right here, guys? Every The offensive line is blocking run. The running backs are showing run. As a defensive guy, I read my keys and I play run. Watch what Bryce Petty does. Pulls it out of the running back's back, throws it right behind me. So what do I do next? I'm sick and tired of that. I'm going to sit back a little bit. I'm not going to get beat by those routes uh, you know, behind me and give up big plays in the passing game. So I hesitate. I slow play it. I make sure it's a run. Is it a run? It looks like a run. And look what happens. Now they get five yards before you know it. All the plays look exactly the same. All of them have run pass options. They take away your instincts. They take away your eyes. And they do it at mock speed. So it's so hard to stop. And the one thing you have to have an ability to do, because they can run and they can throw, and they, they do the, such a great job of the vertical seams, is you have to have corners that can match up. Here's a couple teams over the last couple years that have been able to come up with ways. See how physical they are at the line of scrimmage? That's what you have to do to disrupt the timing. You need to make Bryce Petty hold on to the ball to have any chance at all of disrupting him. Here's West Virginia earlier this year. Notice again the corners up tight, trying to j jam these wide receivers. He looks Looks right, he sees coverage, he comes back to the left. Again, look how tight the coverage is from the corner there. Petty has nowhere to go, he kind of has to hold on to the ball. Now, in order to do that, you better be stout up front because you're expending a lot of energy on the perimeter. That means the defensive line better hold up against an outstanding running back and Shock Linwood, who's capable of doing a lot of things. So the balance of this offense is dynamic. And I don't know, does, does Kansas State have a defense that can match up on the perimeter and walk corners and safeties right up to the line of scrimmage and stop this offense? I don't think they do. I don't think so either, but they have a pretty good running back in Charles Jones. They use him in various ways. Watch him right here. Three different ways I like to use Jones. Like he's 5 foot 10, about 195 pounds. He has good feet and great vision. He's a tough little runner. They also like to use him in the Wildcat. Why? Because he's extremely patient. Watch how he lets his blocks, blockers get in front of him and he goes in untouched. You have to be a patient player to let that play develop like that. And then on third and short situations, they're going to use him in a screen game. Watch him because he's a very physical runner. He's, he's quick. He has great speed. And he's a guy who they love to get the ball to out there in space. He has 12 touchdowns. Ten of them have come from the Wildcat formation, Chris. You guys have analyzed all different aspects of the game. I haven't talked much about Baylor's defense. Sometimes yes. it's irrelevant because they just outscore everybody, but it's a defense that's still the last couple of weeks with the committee watching, whether they like it or not, that against true freshman quarterbacks has given up about 800 passing yards in those two games, 10.9 yards per attempt. That's a monster number. So Waters can throw it. 
The running back is good. Lock yeah. it to me. Those guys have yeah. to make plays. Yeah. On the Sexton's end. great. Very you think of a race. patient running game. Can they make enough explosive plays? K State. Mr. Pollock, is Baylor going to win this ball game tonight? Are they going to do enough, make a strong enough statement in doing so? I, I think what you said is very key, Chris, because I, I don't think their defense is elite by any stretch. You turn on the tape and you kind of sometimes go, ugh, this doesn't look real solid. But I think their offense is good enough in this building to get a win today. I think it's a 38 41 type of game, 38. Low scoring. Then. Low, the low scoring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah low scoring. No, not a lot of points. <laughs> Well, we will see how it unfolds, a primetime ESPN game. This will be one of the primetime pieces of the puzzle. One of the noon Eastern time, 11 o'clock Fort Worth pieces of the puzzle. Travon Boykin, who lit up the Bears but came up three points short here. Does he know they're booty? He kind of waved his hand. And maybe he knows what the, the, what's the scene in Waco is. It'll be a rocket scene. He better be scene. ready today. He froze. Ready. He's ready for Iowa State. Yeah, he better be ready. Paul Rhodes always looks for those upsets. Doug Zeker carrying down a kickoff around the country, including Louisiana Tech and Marshall there. Rakeem Cato capping off a brilliant, a brilliant career against the Louisiana Tech team that is missing five starters because of academic issues. The student athletes did not take care of things in the classroom. They're not eligible to play in the ball game today. Right. Predictions coming up from Waco. Uh-oh. Now let's go inside the headset brought to you by AT&T. Look at this, Chris Felica, the bear. Uh oh bear? He's got his own sign now. Wow, look at you, bear. <laughs> Man. man, you're just sick of him, man. Big time, sick man. Earlier, you. <laughs> oh, he's, he's, he's in the bear claw. Yeah, like claw. You, and your, you and your gang signs. Oh, you all <laughs> all right. He predicted a Baylor win earlier. Noon kickoffs here. Houston and Cincinnati. It's like the old AFC Central, Kirk. Bob Phillip, <laughs> Sam Weich. Exactly. Since he win, they get a piece. Boomer's along with playing Memphis there. and UCF of the American crown. Marshall day. and Louisiana Tech for the Conference USA crown. Marshall hoping that maybe Boise State will lose tonight. They could get one of those New Year's six bids as the group of five. Northern Illinois would be in the conversation as well. And then you see up the road in Fort Worth. The Cyclones stagger in, winless in the Big 12. They did beat Iowa. Big 10 fans remember. Paul Rhodes described his guys' challenge as this. You're 2-9 and nine and playing for what you represent as a human being. <laughs> And the other team wants to score 100 on you if they can. That's for sure. Iowa State won its last visit to TCU. It was Trevon Boykin's first ever start at quarterback. A lot has changed since then. By the way, Rhodes says that Boykin is the difference maker. And without playing TCU, he gives the Frogs an edge over the Bears, in his view, as the better team. They're getting into a frenzy. Gary Patterson will consider TCU co-champs if they get the win. Hoping his alma mater, K-State, can give him some help here. He's with Tom Luganville. Well, Coach, the college football playoff committee bumped you guys to number three last week. In your estimation, is this game about winning or winning with style? Well, for us, it's about winning. I've been saying the journey all the time. Obviously, uh, you know, you have to do what you have to do. But it's um, for us, it's about winning. You got, you know, conference title, Kansas share it. Uh, two good teams play tonight, Baylor and Kansas State. You know, like both of them, they're Big 12 schools. So uh, for us, we got to go win. We got to show the world that we're uh, that we're a good football team and we deserve to be in there. And uh, we'll find out today we can do that. Coach, you had a scare against Kansas a couple of weeks back. And sometimes in the coaching profession, the most difficult thing to do is to prepare your kids to play against an opponent that they should beat. Have you made any tweaks this week with your kids and your approach leading up to this game? Well, it was a lot. You know, we came off we came off some hard, a really hard eight-week cycle. Uh, people were beat up. We got healthy, played a great game against Kansas State, got healthy, got it, uh, played a great game against Texas, and uh, now we finished it off against Iowa State. I think a whole different situation. You're playing at home, doing all the things you need to do uh, for a big game to win a championship. Uh, I'd be really surprised if we don't play great today. Coach, good luck. Thank you. Right. Big 12 did not schedule TCU like a contender. They put them against Iowa State, Bedlam, and of course this game were supposed to be the two big games. You can see how TCU ranks against the Power Five this season in these categories. Numbers that the crowd in Waco couldn't care less about because they're only talking about 61-58. Well, that's why the, the metrics favor them so heavily. I mean, you, you go down the board and look at a lot of the things that they've done all year. Uh, and there's Trevon Boykin. Remember, about four or five weeks ago, people were talking about him being in the Heisman Trophy, what he's brought to this offense, their ability to spread teams out now. 
aggressive approach, his ability when things break down to take off, it's been a big factor in why they're so good. Aaron Greens is speedy back again with B.J. Catalan out with a concussion. He's going to have to carry the load. Good news for Boykin is that he's got finally, for the first time in about six weeks, Des, his full complement of playmakers, Doxon, Listenby, and also Deontay Gray is healthy today. He has a lot of speed out there on the perimeter. Guys who can blow the lid off the defense, Doxon, you look at Listenby right there. He averages 18 yards per catch. I mean, he has guys who can really affect. I think Listenby's going to go for 200 yards receiving today and two touchdowns. Does they have as good a four-by-one unit as anybody in the country <laughs> exactly. playing wide receiver? <laughs> now, how, how is yeah. he going to make enough plays to keep pace with, with TCU's attack? But like you said, Sammy Sammy and the boys, they, they came up with a win. They rallied the troops <laughs> early in the year against uh, against the Hawkeyes. I mean, they're, they're looking to shock the world. Their coach has a great reputation of trying to get his team ready to play. <laughs> There's E.J. Bibbs. He's the tight end. He's their best receiver, their, their best prospect. He's out. He's in street clothes for a second game. That's a big, big blow for Yeah, a big team. loss when you lose your go-to, man. They're going to have to find some other receivers to step up. And, you know, Gary's not going to have any mercy as far as his approach defensively, his scheme. <laughs> he'll he'll pin their ears back and bring a lot of pressure on Sam. Brett McMurphy, ESPN.com, did his survey. The folks here love this overwhelmingly. Patterson from his peers, the coach of the year this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> from his peers, huh? Yeah. Oh, man. Doug Zero continuing to count down to kick off Marshall, hosting the championship game against Louisiana Tech. Skip Pulse got multiple teams to the CUSA title game, but dealing with five starters suspended today. The quarter system there quarter began this week so some guys did not do the job in the classroom Dixon the running back the star player there was originally in that group but he won his appeal he won his appeal so he's back out there but five other starters are not for Louisiana Tech a tall order yeah it is Cato a tall order, order especially Cato and the way he throws the football and you know that that's the thing when you lose players like this in a championship <coughs> atmosphere others will have to step up but Rakeem Cato has an opportunity to go out what a legacy and what great quarterback play they've had there over the years with Leftwich and, and Chad Pennington and punctuate with a conference title yeah. today coming up Harry Mr. Tom Corso's Elson. headgear selection Never been to Waco before. He has shown a fondness for Willie the Wildcat a couple times in the past. But the Bears legend, both Baylor and Chicago, Mike Singletary arriving off the Brazos, joining us on the bridge to make predictions coming up on game day. College game day is built by the Home Depot. Share your tailgate tales with the Home Depot using hashtag Let's Do Game Day. And in part by Night at the Museum 3, Secret of the Tomb, December 19th. And Dr. Pepper, always one of a kind. Let's go back to the grill there. I like the lunchtime almost before <laughs> we get to lunch, though. Saturday Selections brought to you by Chevy Silverado. You can play virtual Saturday Selections online, ESPN.com. Search Chevrolet. Glasses is fired up down there. Near and Waco for the first time. Look at old number 63. Yeah. Ooh. Bears <laughs> legend. Mike Singletary before, of course, he went to the Chicago Bears. Changed to 50 and terrorized offensive players for many, many years. Few played this game with more heart and more intensity. We are honored to have Mike Singletary here in Waco, Texas Great today. To be here. Great to be here. Good to be here. We'll get to the main Great event, Mike, in just a second, though. But we're going to start with Houston and Cincinnati. Tupperville trying to get a piece of the conference ground against the Cougars at home. I, I like the Bearcats. They average 35 points a game, second in the conference. I like Gunner killing that offense. I'm going Cincinnati. It's like the old Oilers versus Bengals. Well, yeah, you yes. know what? I, I'm going to go with Houston. I'm from Houston. Ah. So I'm going. There you go. Oh, oh, I, I, I go. Okay. Hard. Yeah. Following this hard. Not so fast, Mr. Linebacker. <laughs> <laughs> Bearcats winning at home by a touchdown. I'm with Dez. Gunner Keel. Bearcats going to win nine games this year if they yeah. win today. I like UC as well. Now, West Conference Championship game, Fresno State and Boise State. Broncos trying to win and also perhaps get that New Year's Six Bowl bid, which would be nice for them. They beat, them earlier. They beat them earlier by 10 points. I think the Broncos will beat them again, this time by two touchdowns. Two I touchdowns. Got, I got Boise. Yep. On the blue rug. Yeah, on huh? the blue carpet, exactly. Got to go with Boise. Yeah. Fundamentally sound football team. Got to go right. with That's the reason. Blue uniforms and a blue turf. They win, and they get 
Fiesta Bowl. They're going Fiesta, Fiesta Bowl. Bowl. I agree. Right. I, and how about the job Brian Harson's oh. doing there in his, in his first year taking over that program? I agree. They win and they get into one of the big bowls. And see, Lee says That's Fiesta Bowl. Yes, That'd Bowl. be great. Some rain off and on all day in Charlotte. Crooked, I'll be there on ABC, the ACC championship game, Florida State and Georgia Tech. The Knowles survive in advance, survive in advance. Not very big favorite against the Jackets. What happens tonight in Charlotte? You know, I think that the um, Georgia Tech's offense is going to sputter because of Smelter. He's not there. So when they need to throw the ball, they don't have that deep threat. He averages 20 yards per catch. So I have Florida State in another close one, of course. Being on defense. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, how do you see that? Uh, I see Florida State coming out and, and beginning to score some points early, making a difference. You can turn it around, reverse yes. the trend. Right. Yes. Florida State wins it by one point. Somehow, someway, they beat Budo. <laughs> SEC championship game. Alabama is a two touchdown favorite against a Missouri team. As you mentioned earlier, has a strong pattern of pulling upsets when they're underdogs. I tell you what, I think that Nick Saban showed that defense, that foot, that film from a week ago, the Iron Bowl. He's going to have those guys fired up. I do like Missouri's defense. I expect a competitive game, but I got Alabama beating Missouri. There was no defense in the Iron Bowl, Mike. <laughs> what about today? I'm, I got to go with Alabama. I, I, I think they're ready to go. I think they're primed to, to take it to another level. That's a great pick, but it's going to be close Alabama field goal I don't think Alabama respects Missouri I think they'll show up flat despite how they played last week I think Missouri has the best defense line in the country they can challenge Blake Sims I think Bama pulls away but it won't be until the second half I like Alabama to win the game tonight in Indy Big Ten championship game Wisconsin is the favorite Melvin Gordon trying to make a statement as a Heisman candidate but more importantly for Wisconsin trying to win the conference title against Cardell Jones, the young quarterback for Ohio State. How will he step in, and what will the Buckeyes do? I think that Urban Meyer is going to do a great job just letting this guy go out there and play and use the weapons around him. My concern is obviously Wisconsin's offensive line. They may be without their center. It's a game-time decision. I still think that Melvin Gordon is probably the best player in that game, and I think that Wisconsin will beat them by three points. I don't really have a choice here. Because of the connection with the playoff? Well, well no, you see, the, the, the whole thing is my wife is from Detroit. My, my wife is from Michigan, so right. uh, they don't really like Michigan, you know, Ohio State. So I, I, I got to go. I got a nephew at, at uh, Wisconsin, Eric, and so Wisconsin. <laughs> go. I got to go with Wisconsin. The nephew and the wife. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's not so what, what did you just say? <laughs> not so not fast. So fast. <laughs> not so fast as the guy down there. Not so fast. Ohio State. Jalen Marshall. Jalen Marshall yeah. come in to play some Wildcat at quarterback. Urban Meyer, as an underdog, gets his team very, very motivated. I think the defense from Ohio State will be challenged stopping Melvin Gordon. But I think the big playability in the passing game from Ohio State is the difference in yes. this game. Ohio State beats Wisconsin. Yes, sir. I'm you excited. can tell how they're hoping for upsets here. Yeah. All the teams that are competing with Baylor. <laughs> you can hope the Cyclones shock the world. I mean, TCU <laughs> is a five-touchdown favorite. Let's just say, how close is this game? Is it pretty enough for TCU? you to, to stay in the bracket. They better go home and pray on this one because uh, the Cyclones will not keep it close. The Horn Frogs understand style points matter and they will blow out the Cyclones today. I got a bone to pick with TCU. Mm, yeah. We have a bone to pick with TCU here oh, yeah. in Waco. Yeah. Um, I got to go with the Cyclones. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> hey. That is crazy. Oh. You should. You want to take it back? Want to take it back? I mean, take it back. Hey, you got to be, yeah, <laughs> be crazy. You got to be crazy. him play. He was a little bit crazy. Oh, yes. TCU's a 34-point favorite, and they win by 35. TCU. That would be as bad as hey. West Virginia losing to Pitt back in 2007 if, right. if uh, no, Iowa no. State knocked out no, TCU. No. I, I, think, I think TCU starts fast. Oh, and they, they are going for style points today. They, they win convincingly over <laughs> Iowa State. Well, about 24 hours from now, we will hear it from Grapevine. Again, to refrain yeah. this song, Grapevine, Texas. This is the committee room. I wonder if they're watching college game day. Certainly getting ready to watch TCU and Iowa State. I applaud. Every one of them getting booed. I applaud their efforts. They're doing a great job. Okay, look at them clowning around. They're doing a good job. Isn't that serious? Yep, now, boys. They will have their eyes on McLean City tonight when K-State and TCU compete each for a share 
of the Big 12 title, although they don't want to hear about a share. They're going to think they're the one true champions, regardless of what TCU does. What happens tonight under the lights of McLean Stadium in front of all these people? Well, I tell you what, he just looked at me and said, I have a bone to pick. And I thought he was going to say me. Oh. <laughs> he said Cyclone. So I don't want him to have to pick any bones with me. I'm going Baylor Bears. My man RG3, my Heisman brother. And I don't want to have any problems at the desk. I got Baylor. Fear of respect for Singletary. Yes, sir, Mr. Singletary, <laughs> sir. All right. <laughs> I, you know, Kansas State comes into this football game with a quarterback that can make plays. Defense can make you earn this. But listen, Kansas State, don't take this one personally. You've come into Waco at the wrong time. Baylor wins and wins big. big. I don't see Kansas big. State competing at all in this game. Big. 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 Blowout. A blowout. I, I, I do think Kansas State is, is a, a well-coached team, uh, but, but not tonight. Not tonight. Not here. Baylor, Baylor, Baylor's not, take not here. No way. Baylor's going to take it. Uh, great pick. Okay. Now, listen to this. Baylor has won 15 straight games there yep. at home. They've only lost one game in the last four years here. TCU. They beat TCU here. That's right. And uh -huh. they belong uh -huh. in the Final Four, not TCU. Baylor belongs in the Final Four. As Mike... As Mike has said in the past few years, Mike has said this. Mike, what do you say? Mike, I want here. winners. I want people that want to win. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, folks, you want winners, right? Well, the winners are wearing purple. Give me Willie the Wildcat. Wow. Verdict on this tonight, <laughs> Mike. We thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> yeah, beat him up. <laughs> He's got no fear in you. It's been a blast in Waco. Oh, well, Enjoy the championship <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> TC <laughs> starts on ABC on ESPN. We go to Cincinnati. Sean McDonough, Chris Beelman, at Todd McShay. Enjoy your Saturday, oh, folks. John Crazy. <laughs> All right, Chris, thank you very much, and welcome, everybody, to ESPN College Football, part of Jimmy V Week.